wanting to do the right thing for the people they represent and the right thing for the entire state of Colorado. So uh, again, I, but it's it's been my pleasure and I'm proud to have been uh, able to represent Southwest Colorado. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zink. Commissioner Hickey. Thank you, good morning. I will add my voice to those. First, thanking the chair. Uh, chair Stewart has done an excellent job of listening to all the uh, inputs, but coordinating us towards conclusion. And that is a, um, she's done a masterful job of that over the past year. Uh, I also want to add my voice to thank Commissioner Gifford, Commissioner Zink, and Commissioner Thibault, and to say we and I will really miss them. I have learned just over the last six months now, since I've been on the commission, the amount of work and thoughtfulness uh, that they have put into this job, and um, I really respect and admire the work they've done, and they've really shown me the way of how uh, being a commissioner can be um, and how to do it well. And so I will strive to just uh, emulate that just a small in a small way. Um, otherwise, thank you all. Thank you all the staff for all of the, your work and, and ability to listen to us on all things from down to the details to the highest level policy issues. And, and you cover all of that Span and do it very well and competently every day. So I appreciate that also. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Tebow. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Um, like Commissioners Gifford and Zink, this is my last regularly scheduled meeting. I'm holding out that maybe we'll have a special meeting later in the month. So because I have a bunch of amendments I'd like to offer at that meeting. Um, but you know, it's, it's moments like this that perhaps the least said is the best said, um, but I don't intend to follow that advice. Um, I really feel comfortable today because at last, after eight years, I'm at the far left of the podium. And this is my rightful place where I should have started, but I was on the right side to start and now I'm moving where I belong. But in all seriousness, um, I too want to um, thank uh, my fellow commissioners for your dedicated service. And as Commissioner Zink mentioned, those commissioners that have come and gone are commissioners that um, were like you in, in their stead. The commissioners have an enormous responsibility under the statute, something that I um, took and take very seriously. Um, but I especially want to single out um, Commissioner Stewart, congratulate her on her reappointment to the commission, which I'm not sure is um, public uh, at this point, but I'm going to make it public because I think you will be, uh, along with uh, Commissioner Hall as the new chair, um, the institutional knowledge that is the foundational piece that um, institutions like a commission, you know, rely on uh, greatly. And so I, I, I thank you for, for your continued service. Um, in eight years, we have, I have served with uh, Commissioner Zink and Gifford uh, under four different, under, under four different executive directors, under three different chief engineers, and for me, under three Region 2 RTDs, uh, Rich Zamora being the, the current RTD who is a tremendous advocate for our region and his staff is just remarkable. Uh, they have helped me out immensely as I have undertaken my duties. And it would, it would be a, a misstep if I didn't once again recognize Herman, who really isn't to my left, he's just sitting there and um, his staff, and especially Jennifer, for just taking care of me and all of us throughout these years. Um, I'm very high maintenance in terms of uh, getting my materials and, and getting uh, situated the way I like to serve in this post. And um, 
I, I just appreciate that. As I do appreciate the whole uh, executive management team, and I know we only have about nine or ten in the audience for those who are listening over the internet, um, but as part of the executive management team, we currently have a lot of the, all the RTDs. Uh, when, when I started on the commission, RTDs didn't really hold a place at the table as, as you all do now. And I think that was a tremendous um, positive in terms of helping guide the commission making the right decisions. So overall, there's so many staff members that I have worked with at headquarters and throughout Region 2 in particular, and perhaps in other regions, that I just probably wouldn't know who they are or what their names are. Uh, I've talked to them while they're mowing on the side of the road. I've talked to them while they're coming in and out of the Lamar headquarters. These are dedicated people who, frankly, in many respects, risk their lives every day so that our transportation system can be a safe and effective one. So for that, um, my experience will be as Senator, not Senator, Commissioner Zink. Boy, did I, did I go back into La La Land there for a minute, but you know, it's uh, bittersweet. And so with that, I, uh, I just do appreciate all of you and um, look forward to seeing you down the road. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner Tebow. Commissioner Feedy. Yeah, thank you. I want to also thank Shannon, Sydney, and Bill for for your service to the commission and appreciate all your perspectives over these last couple of years that I've gotten to know you and you will be missed. We'll miss uh, our proofreader and uh, policy people that uh, help help keep us balanced. Hopefully your replacements will bring their own unique qualities that will uh, strengthen this board and and help guide the, the state transportation system into the future. Um, and Shannon, thank you for the, the great host last night and the meal. Um, very appreciated. <laughs> um, as far as my my region, we uh, had TPR meeting on Monday. Um, not a lot there. It was updates for the, the group. Um, couple ideas I've had with all the rain we've had in eastern Colorado this spring, which has made us greener than we've been in quite a few years. We are grateful for that, but it kind of raised a, an idea for our people that when we do construction is to look at the vegetation we plant on the side, try to stay with the shorter grass. Um, we have grass that's two, three feet tall on the edges of the road, which increased the risk of wildlife uh, strikes and and visibility and having to mow more, much sooner in the season than we normally do. Um, and so we'll have to be probably mowing twice or three times this year if we continue to get moisture. So looking at trying to, when we revegetate, using, making sure we put in vegetation at least in that first segment next to the rows of your buffalo grass, your shorter grasses, um, to try to stay away from the burrows and some of the taller things that we do have out there now. Some of those I think have come in naturally from the wetter environment we have along our roads. They like that, that soil and they eventually come in on their own. But when we do, I'd like whichever department, I don't know who all makes that decision. Um, <laughs> one of the many areas I don't fully understand yet of CDOT where all those decisions are made, but just make sure we're using vegetation that tries to minimize the, the amount of maintenance we have to do with mowing and things. Um, the clovers are nice for the pollinators, but it's also when we're wet. It's, a tall crop that tends to uh, increase the risk of wildlife strikes and just visibility. And as it dries down in the fall, increases the fire danger. So those are considerations I like the staff to, to consider in the future and look at policies on that. Um, noticed on Memorial Day, a uh, huge increase in traffic coming through uh, my district. Uh, the interstate was very busy. Even our other roads were busy with, it looked like people coming out of the front range to the, the lakes along the Arkansas Valley, um, down 71 and things. Um, so people are definitely getting back out even more so than they were last year on, on the travel um, with the lifting of restrictions and things. So um, it, 
just raises the need for that tourism. Also, I was surprised the one day when I was coming back from Ordway back to Lyman and the number of campers I saw going south, I'm assuming headed to the lakes down there um, in that area um, and on the narrow roads and things. It, it, our continued need to maintain our statewide system to serve everyone. So um, another thing I want to thank the RTD for their work and all the state staff and for working with us and giving us information and helping us make decisions. Um, one thing I would like to, the commission to consider is possibly us just having an informal session where we can talk to RTDs with the commission and share ideas and and something a little more informal than always these formal meetings. Um, just something to consider for some time in the you know, future, a breakfast or a, a lunch where we're not an official meeting, but just to kind of share information and ideas on how to improve our state system. So with that, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So the irony today is that I've been the chair for one year, and this is the first time I've sat in this seat. It's true. Um, but, you know, we talk about how the last year has been so productive, and I really have to thank Jennifer Ubler because you made the seamless transition for us. Um, we snapped our fingers and said, okay, we're not doing things like we've ever done them before. We're doing them a different way. You made that happen. And you held our hands behind the scenes, and I, I you never, you're never there in picture, <laughs> but you're always there helping us, and um, I can't thank you enough for that. You made the process of running a meeting virtually so much easier for me than it would have been if I hadn't had you right there, and I think the rest of us feel the same way, so thank you. I, I want to thank you a lot, and I want to thank CDOT staff, all 3,000 people that work for CDOT, because they didn't take time off. Just because we weren't here, work still got done and people still did their jobs. And it was incredible to see the ways that um, work processed, regardless of us being in the same room and talking to each other face to face. And um, I, I really do appreciate that. Um, there's no way we could not have today's reports without thanking three of our commissioners who personifies um, the types of people that we have on the commission. And um, I want to thank them for their public service commitment to CDOT and for their dedication to Colorado. You know, a measure of um, excellence in leadership is the respect and admiration of your peers. And you have that, you heard that today, and, and you have that. And uh, when I came on, um, Sydney took over as the, as the chair, Commissioner Zink. And um, I thought, wow, that's, that's a great job. And I don't think I would ever want to be the chair. It's a lot of work. And then when Shannon came on, Mr. Gifford, I, I watched her and got a lot of pointers from her and thought, well, that's a great job. I sure wouldn't want to have to do that. And then when Commissioner Tebow came on, he did a great job. And I thought the same thing. And then by happenstance, I became the chair. And, and it's, it's not hard work, but it's um, concentrated work. And uh, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Tebow for his sense of humor and uh, Commis Commissioner Zink uh, for her sense of correctness and uh, Commissioner Gifford for her sense of logic, but I want to thank all of them for their sense of service. Um, and gosh, we are really going to miss you. So thank you very much, everyone, um, for being part of this team. We'll have a new team next month, but this team is extraordinary, and um, it's like uh, Camelot, you know, the time when things all came together and it won't be the same, wasn't the same before and won't be the same afterwards, but thank you all. It's been my privilege to be the chair. Thank you very much for the kind words that you gave me. Thank you. The next order of business is the Executive Director's Management Report. Um, Deputy Director, do you want to give any report? No, thank you. <laughs> well, didn't want to slight you, yes, okay. 
Uh, so now we'll go to Steve Harrelson for the Chief Dig Engineer's report. Thanks. So I have a couple things to talk about today. First off, um, I have an exciting announcement. We've hired uh, the new manager of the uh, Program Reporting and Transparency Office, which was formerly called the PMO. Um, our new manager is Hillary Hawthorne. She um, worked for about 15 years at CDOT, um, starting out in Staff Bridge, then she worked as a design engineer, a construction engineer, and she was a PMO rep for Region 1. Um, and then also has some experience in the business office. So she's got a wide variety of experience in, in program delivery. So we think she's gonna be a, a great uh, manager of, of PRTO. We're also reorganizing that unit a little bit. We've, we've got a, an existing, what I call a computer guru, uh, Brian Metzger, and we're, we're gonna kind of elevate his role. So he will kind of be the chief data architect for all of our reporting systems and and Hillary will be more of the, uh, the, the program reporting and kind of be the liaison with the regions and, and Brian is gonna uh, try to run the, the engine in the background. So very excited about that. Um, and you know, we've got the, uh, the on-track system coming online and that's gonna really help our reporting and transparency and I, I think we're gonna be firing on all cylinders here in a very short time. Second thing I wanna talk about is um, uh, geology and geohazards. Um, you know, last month I, I talked about a book um, about Washington Roebling and the Brooklyn Bridge, and I thought I'd drink from that well again. Um, it's like the Chief Engineer's Book Club. I'm, I'm like Oprah's geeky little brother. Um, this month's selection is, is a little more obscure. I don't think it will be on uh, Oprah's bookshelf. It's, it's called the Transportation Research Circular E-C-141. And the, the English title is Colorado's Full-Scale Field Testing of Rockfall Attenuator System. And this is 130 pages of wonderful science. Um, what, what these researchers did is they, they cast uh, a half dozen different cuboxo feed bags, which are um, they're polyhedra that are uh, eight triangle faces and six square faces. In order to visualize it, it's like a, a cube with all eight corners sliced off. So it's like a spheroidal piece of concrete. And what they did is they, they painted each of the faces different colors and put X's and such on them. And then they took these rocks, lifted them up in a, from a crane, and dropped them down a mountain. And they set high-speed cameras up and they could tell how fast the rock, as it fell, it has potential energy up here. It hits the mountain and as it bounces, it starts spinning. So for those of you who have freshman physics, you know there's the kinetic energy of the spin or the kinetic energy of its, um, of its horizontal motion. And they, they calculated that to see how strong the rock fall attenuator sensors or rock mesh needed to be. Um, this sort of experiment had never been done before. This, this work was published in 2009, and it is, it's, it's achieved worldwide attention. Um, and one of the, uh, the most interesting parts of the paper is, is a, um, a concluding sentence in the abstract. And um, on the basis of the test results, a new series of attenuator systems have been installed above I-70 at the Georgetown Incline site. Recently, a 730 kilogram, which is about 1,800 pounds, rock was dropped from a helicopter onto the slope above the highest attenuator. The new system performed as intended. I mean, that's, that's engineering, man. That's, and so you, you're probably wondering why I, I want to bring attention to this wonderful, though obscure paper. And the, the reason is one of the co-authors was CDOT's own Ty Ortiz. And Ty um, just retired in the last month. And you know, as I, as I said, this is engineering, this is science, this is, this is what we ought to be doing. And I think CDOT should be very proud of Ty. 
He's a Pueblo boy. I don't know if you knew that, Phil. But, you know, many of you have probably seen him on the news whenever there's a rock slide. He's the guy that gets called out on, on Thanksgiving Day and says, oh, yeah, that's, that's a big rock and it's on the road. Some, somebody ought to do something. But, but Ty truly was a legend. He's, he's one of the finest engineers I've ever worked with, and, and I could not let his retirement go without uh, including him in Oprah's Beefy Little Brothers Book Club. So that's what I got. Could I make a comment? Yes. Um, I, uh, I was friends with Ty's mother, Priscilla, for many years. Unfortunately, she's deceased. So um, I remember Ty as he was growing up. And but he was older than you. Well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's how early can you retire? Uh, he doesn't seem old enough to Amen, retire. brother. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. We look forward to the next month's book report. That was really fascinating, and I'm, it makes me happy to know how you decide where to put all those barriers, because I, I knew there was some science, but that was really interesting. Thank you for that. I drive by those barriers all the time, and I'm happy they're there. So next book report, you're going to tell us that the dog ate your book report. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, next is um, HPT Director's Report, Nick Farber. Yes, sir. Um, so yesterday at the uh, HPT board meeting, uh, the board adjusted tolls in I-25 North, segments 2 and 3, um, 15 to 20 cents for AVI or for uh, transponders, and 19 to 28 cents for LTT or the license plate tolls just on I-25 from segments uh, from 36 all the way up to E-470 Northwest Parkway. Um, we did this because we had we saw a 30% increase in uh, total transaction processing costs, and to help cover those costs, uh, uh, we uh, thought it was appropriate to adjust tolls upward. Those will go into effect on July 11th. Um, we also reduced, the board also reduced the wind down period on our tolling services agreement with uh, E-470 from 24 months to 21 months. We had it, the tolling services agreement expires on June 30th, 2023, and we have to give E-470 two years notice before we uh, terminate that agreement. We're still in the process of figuring out our procurement process for our, our future commercial back office system, and we need some time to figure out next steps on that. So we've come to an agreement with E-470 to reduce our wind down period three months to extend the date until September 30th of this year. Uh, we also had a board retreat where we discussed um, our 2020 uh, board retreat outcomes, which happened a month before the pandemic hit. Um, we also discussed how dynamic pricing works, because we're going to be with our new uh, tolling equipment provider, we will be moving to all dynamic pricing instead of the uh, time of day pricing that we have now and it's been in place since 2006. Um, time of day pricing is just a set uh, price for peak and off peak periods. Um, we talked about we want to have a soft cap or a hard cap. How often do we want to have full change changes? So to change between five and 25 minutes. How much do we want to see uh, toll price changes? Do we want to see five cents every five minutes or 10 minutes? Or do we want to see 10 or 15, 25 cents? So these are decisions the board will be making in the coming months as we update our toll rate setting policy to, um, to accommodate uh, future dynamic pricing. We expect dynamic pricing to go into effect um, August of next year on the westbound uh, mountain express lane. And as we roll out new express lanes on South Gap, I-25 North, they will be open and fully dynamic instead of the fixed time of day pricing we have now. Um, We'll also be life cycling out uh, tolling equipment on I-25, E-470, and the eastbound mountain express lane to accommodate dynamic pricing in the future. Um, we also talked about the final express lanes master plan recommendation since that finished up the month before the pandemic hit as well. Um, also, last month on the 26th, we, cl we closed on the Burnham Yard property with the New Pacific Railroad. Um, when I talked to most of you individually about the Burnham Yard property acquisition, the 
comment I heard from the, the board and from commissioners is, where's RTD in all this? Um, so I spoke to Bill Van Meter, uh, the director of operations for RTD about that. And they recognize their obligation to contribute money to the property. However, they are not in a position to do it in the near term. Uh, but we will be negotiating, start negotiating an IGA with them in the coming months or so on how that contribution looks. Um, uh, and I also met with the I-20, the, the North Point Range MPO to talk about the RODIS proposal and also our, the status of the I-25 North Pithy alone. Um, in regards to the I-25 North Pithy alone, we, we were at the Build America Bureau moved us into the credit worthiness phase. Um, they need to hire uh, legal counsel, traffic and revenue advisors, and financial advisors. And once they have those advisors on board, we'll start negotiating the loan, and we hope to close by next sometime this fall. And um, that's all I have for the Justice Court this month. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Mr. Vasquez, for those of us who aren't part of HPTE, can you explain dynamic pricing? So dynamic pricing, there's sensors in the uh, uh, more sophisticated traffic sensors in the express lane and the general purpose lanes. And it measures traffic volume in both and an algorithm um, then that is developed by our towing uh, equipment provider uh, takes the, the, that information from those sensors and adjusts toll prices up or down based on the level of traffic in the general purpose lanes and also in the express lane. Um, I, we saw yesterday by traffic going up, uh, we had a, a screenshot of a, an algorithm. It moved prices up two cents, and then it, you know, 10 minutes later, it moved them down uh, six cents, and then it kind of kind of goes up and down based on traffic volume. So it's, it's constantly adjusting based on current conditions. Uh, right now, we just take uh, the last year's traffic data from the entire year, and then we base toll rates on that. Um, like th this will actually be in real time, and so it's going to be a huge. It's, it's going to be a huge change for the traveling public. So we also talked about the public outreach campaign that we're going to have to do for it. Yeah, that was going to be my question: is how you let the, the users know what's going on. Yeah, big big change. As you know, we're one of the last states that actually uses fixed time of day pricing. Um, most states have completely, states with express lanes have moved to four dynamic pricing. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Next is uh, State Legislative Report, Andy Carson, in person. What, what do they say? What do so they with the same Kim Kardashian. They call me Kardashian. <laughs> it happens more often than you would think. So. <laughs> Andy Kardashian. So thank you very much for being able to be here today. It's a pleasure to be here in front of you. I've been giving you all updates on the legislative issues over the over Zoom calls for quite a while. So it's a pleasure to be here. Final one for the year, historic legislative session that we've had this year. You've talked about 260 a lot. Um, I'm not going to get into that except to thank uh, Jeff Sudemeyer and Rebecca White for stepping up and really jumping in and being an a integral part of, of getting that bill passed, providing a lot of the information and, and the, the background and the help during the legislative session. Huge victory for all of us. Um, I'll be sending out a final legislative report that details all of the bills that we, we tracked and, and dealt with, but I'm just going to give you a quick overview just to give you a sense of kind of the, the mosaic of what we had to deal with during this weird 2021 legislative session. So we had some, uh, some smaller bills that dealt with some state audit findings that we went into the legislative session knowing we were going to have to fix. One was a simple one that clarified some fiscal reporting to the state, uh, state controller's office. Another one allows the Office of Information Technology to delegate to CDOT our management of our IT systems, which was a small change legislatively, but a huge change administratively. We had some random bills come out. One dealt with trying to establish a dialysis program here at CDOT to, to reimburse dialysis transportation program. Uh, that one died. <laughs> it was delayed for further conversation. 
Another bill that was amended heavily that we worked on was to protect our crash record uh, information, our database here internally. There was a bill that would have required uh, outreach to folks uh, that we hold their personal identifying information every 90 days. It would have been a huge impact for us to do that. So we were able to, to engage on that and, and amend that. Of course, a big priority bill for us this year was our project limit bill. You know, shout out to Goolsby. Director Goolsby, um, big help on that uh, out on the West Slope, and of course the uh, alternative delivery project bill that we opposed and were able to kill from Senator Scott, but we were able to get even better transparency and efficiency language for those projects into 260. That was a nice, uh, nice pivot. We had some uh, conversations about the lands that we own, and we were amended a bill that protects the uh, Transportation Commission's process on disposing of state lands and, and our right-of-ways and whatnot, uh, making sure that those, uh, those relevant lands are, are, uh, are part of a discussion for affordable housing and or uh, renewable energy, but for the vast majority of the lands we have that go through the process that we already have, that process is protected. Of course, a late bill that we've talked about many times is the outdoor advertising bill. We didn't see that one coming at the beginning of the session, but we're able to get a late bill and get that through and, and protect against um, you know, the, the regulations going away through a lawsuit. A lot of conversations about greenhouse gases, and one of the smaller bills that we worked on was to uh, begin quantifying what greenhouse gases come from our construction materials and our projects, uh, building that into the much larger conversation, so kind of building a process from projects to rules and uh, the, you know, having a holistic look at that. Some transit, uh, of course, the huge, largest special district in the state was created this session with the rail district, the Front Range Passenger Rail District, and we did a, a small bill that had to deal with allowing small carpool companies to not be registered as Lyfts or Ubers. Um, instead, they will report to CDOT and have a much more uh, simple, efficient way of reporting in order to operate carpool apps and connect people to get up and down the I-70 corridor. And then finally, just a few small safety. We got some uh, $2 million for DUI enforcement for the next year, and then we got a CDC grant, which is very rare for the Department of Transportation, and that's for money to uh, uh, help a collaboration between DOLA, DNR, and CDOT and some water districts down in the Four Corners area to establish a uh, weather tower down there to do better accurate reporting for water and uh, weather down in the Four Corners area. So that was just part of a very successful legislative session that we had. So thanks to everybody who helped support um, me and you know the OPGR staff in getting all of these passed. And Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for Andy? For Mr. Kardashian? No? Mm -hmm. Well, we really appreciated you coming to uh, Transportation Commission uh, this year and, and talking us through this. I know we sat in on a couple of stack meetings where you did that for stack, and I thought, well, you know, some of us can't make that Friday meeting, and this has really been an added um, bonus for us to have you. Thanks for all your hard work on this. I think this is maybe a historic year of um, things moving forward, not just dying off. So, yeah, you earned your money this year. So, That'll yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next, we have um, FHWA Division Administrative Support, John Cater. Oh, there you are, John. Uh, and we see John, smiling face there. So, uh, John, welcome. I look forward to your report. All right. Well, well thank you. And uh, I, uh, I guess I, I first have to apologize for not being there in person. I, when this was the first announced that it was going to be uh, uh, in person meeting, I fully expected that I, I would be able to attend, but. Uh, uh, Federal Highway, we are still under our uh, previous prohibition about uh, attending in-person meetings. So I'm at this point fully expecting to be there in July and uh, hopefully I won't be disappointed, but you never know. We're, we're taking a very national approach to this and not every every part of the country has is as far along with vaccinations and other things as, as we are here in Colorado. So um, just having to be patient, but, but we shall see. Um, we shall see, I guess, I'll leave it at that. Um, I guess I'll start with thanking uh, Commissioner Stanton for your, your bring up fatalities and the safety issue um, with your remarks. I think that's it's very important we keep that at the forefront. I, over the last um, few weeks, I've been reading the fatality reports we've been getting for this this for the past month, and it's just 
is just so so frustrating and and, and saddening to see the uh, number of, of uh, fatalities we're having, especially you know, the reckless behaviors and especially motorcycles. The number of fatalities with motorcycles over the last uh, couple of months is just it's just you shake your head because it's just it continues. It's one of those things that we think we're we're doing everything we can think of, and yet yet it keeps happening. So we're gonna have to keep finding ways to to tackle that one because that's a tough one and we're seeing so many of them this year. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a hard thing to see and, and one we have to continue to be vigilant on. Um, I really want to just recognize uh, and thank uh, the, the three retiring commissioners for your service here to, to the state of Colorado. And just not only as a member of Federal High, but just as a, as a citizen of Colorado, all three of you have served as, as, as chairs. All three of you have done an exemplary job at, at getting up to speed on all the nuance of transportation and the acronyms and the you know, depending where you come from and with your, your previous uh, experiences, there's still a lot to learn. And it's and I and that goes for, for everybody who serves on the commission. But uh, just thank you all for your your uh, your efforts, your service, and your and the great job you did. I, I think um, Commissioner Tebow, I think of our, our conversations with uh, Topeka and um, Pueblo, and uh, I think of your your uh, your great leadership with the uh, the Remembrance Day down Region Two. Region Two does a great job with that, and you're you're just being a great great part of that, and just. And the leadership you did for Region Region Two down there, I thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Zink. Um, I think about you know 550, 160, all the, the challenges there, and getting that now under construction, and hopefully having that um, have have a, a, a ribbon cutting on that here in a, in a year or two. So looking forward to, looking forward to that, as well as the stuff, all this, the stuff going on with the tribes and stuff, and the archaeology and all the, the challenges down there that, that you helped uh, play a leadership role in. So that that's been a great accomplishment down there. Thank you for that, and Commissioner. Um, Gifford, you know, thank you as well. I, I think of the uh, the time you had us all to your home for uh, the welcome for the uh, new executive director and uh, you know your your gracious hospitality there, as well as your leadership in uh, in the metro area and, and getting the Central Seventy project through. Again, that's a, that was a, a, a an incredible lift, a, na a project of national interest, and a great success story and feathering your cap. So, so all three of you, thank you so much for your service and uh, you know, just best best wishes going forward. And uh, you know. Um, hope to hope to see you see you down the road sometime. So so thank you very much, and that's that's my uh, my report for this month. Thanks, John. We look forward to seeing you next month in person. Next, we have the stack report uh, in person. Vince Rogalski. Try a new format. The hotel's business office doesn't operate anymore, so I can't print my reports. So it gets a little difficult somehow to uh, put this all together, so I'm gonna be trying this. Okay, um, last Friday, um, the stack met. We talked about a number of different things, and normally we, ha we have an update on current events uh, that Herman provides. However, Herman uh, goes is on vacation. And uh, Sally uh, Chaffee provided a, an update on some of the uh, items and news. CDOT is producing media and public education outreach about the safety of our highways. Uh, we talked a little bit, and John talked about the fact um, of the number of fatalities on our roads. And one of the other little uh, interesting things is 30% of the deaths in Colorado are caused by distracted drivers. It only takes a, an instant to be distracted in your hand to move that steering wheel and you go right into somebody else and that's not so good. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Transit and Rail has a new director, Amy Amber, excuse me, Amber uh, Blake. Um, and she's come to the position and will help us because she's had a lot of experience with transit. Um, the city manager of Durango, uh, she was one of her former positions, and she starts uh, taking over um, the transit and rail on June 28th. Okay, we had a, a, a large presentation from Andy. You just had one, too. And one of the things we talked about is uh, Senate Bill 260, and a considerable discussion and questions were uh, developed around the 10-year plan and how this is going to affect the 10-year plan because we've had a number of different uh, programs in terms of Senate Bill 1, Senate Bill 267, COVID stimulus package, 
uh, various other programs, and now we have uh, Senate Bill 260. And so how is that going to affect the 10-year plan? In order to utilize current stimulus funds more quickly, the staff uh, will propose a 10-year plan projects to stack and the TC in July and how that's all going to work. And while the existing plans uh, uh, remain the focus of the next 10 years uh, funding uh, program, stack discussion will also ensue in coming months on the progress of or the process of how to update the 10-year plan because we're already starting to get into a number of years where we're losing on some of those plans and we need to add in the back end some uh, additional programs to make sure the 10-year plan is fully uh, funded and operating. Uh, direct funding to local governments will not be available to the HDPF until uh, revenues begin to accumulate, which is in the fiscal year 2023. Now, Andy gave a whole long, um, I don't want to say dissertation, but a long, a long um, report about all the other projects and laws and uh, regulations that the legislature were able to put together. And he gave us the same thing. You know, at the stack meeting, I had to do this too, and I was almost swallowing the microphone. It was so um, uh, close. Um, and so I'm not going to report on that because you've got a full report from Andy just a minute ago. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about that's not necessarily in the formal report is the fact that one of the things we do at the stack meeting is each TPR and MPO give a report about what's happening since the last uh, stack meeting in terms of what's going on in their community. And I've had a number of co comments from various people, some of the commissioners, about the fact that how much they learn about the entire state by watching those reports. So I want to thank the number of commissioners who attended those um, stack meetings. Uh, it was virtual. Um, and encourage others to also attend when we have virtual meetings or come to the meetings here in person when we have those. Um, induced travel demand. What does that mean, induced travel demand? Well, really what it's talking about is why does the traffic on a new section of highway increase as new improvements are happening? And that seems to be an induced demand. And what's happening is, is you know, as the traffic gets too congested, people stop using that particular road. And they'll stop uh, using the interstate or whatever and start using local roads. But when you make an improvement, now the highway is better, so everybody comes back. And so you see a great increase in demand. And so that's uh, what they were talking about in terms of indu induced demand. The thing of it is, is how do you predict that? And so we had a little presentation from Eric Sabina on terms of how the models are put together. Now, um, Dr. Cog has a different model than what CDOT uses, but CDOT does consult with uh, uh, Dr. Cog on some of their models. And so um, population is held constant when they start doing these models. Colorado's population keeps increasing drastically over the last several years. In fact, housing demands have increased so much that you can't find a house. And if you find a house, you can't buy it quick enough. And so you end up paying a lot more than what it's really worth. Of course, it may be worth a lot if you can't find any place to live. See, got to work this out. So um, that was presented. And then we had a report on asset performance reporting. And uh, what uh, William Johnson provided for us was an update on what he gave you yesterday in terms of what that is. Lastly, one of the things we talked about was how do we conduct our meetings? Now, this was an in-person meeting, right? There were only three 
representatives from an MPO or TPR at our meeting here last Friday. Myself, and uh, of course, one of the other persons that were there was a representative from Durango. <laughs> it does seem that sometimes when you attend meetings, the people most far away are the ones who are there the most early, and so they're ready and prepared. But the one who lives across the street can't get there on time. And so you wonder about what's going on. And so we talked about what are the possibilities of kinds of meetings that we're going to have in the future. And so we all agreed that we're going to have an in-person meeting uh, this next month on July 9th. Um, everybody that we talked to at the, at the meeting virtually agreed that in-person meetings are the best types of meetings because you have a, a chance to talk to the people who are there at the meetings. The meeting is one thing, but during breaks or getting together before or after are also important sessions where you, you communicate various aspects of what you're thinking about. And so we're talking about bi-monthly meetings in person, quarterly meetings in person, and the rest of them maybe being virtual. So that's one of the big topics we're going to talk about at our next meeting. And so I don't know what's going to happen after the next meeting in terms of in-person or virtual meetings, but hopefully we'll have a good discussion about that and come up with an appropriate decision. Comments or questions? Um, Mr. Beatty? I didn't watch the uh, SAC meeting, but the induced demand, I was wondering how much they're evaluating just, I don't know if you have the answer, but for future for the commission maybe is how they evaluate the induced demand, but how that improves like neighborhoods and other areas when we do a state highway improvement, which should be trying to take the large volume and how that improves the safety and things right. in the, and so the other. So th that's just Rebecca, something for future. Do you have anything or what, are you gonna or, present? Or put that for a future commission update okay. somewhere. So, so you guys will, yeah, you guys will get that too. One that so. just raised my mind is we talk about induced demand if we increase the fast on state highway, but there's a lot of secondary improvements when we do a state highway that helps the community for safety and all the other modes of transportation. So just wondering how that's working. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Mr. Vasquez, your comment about how to conduct these meetings post-pandemic, virtual, in-person, or mixed. It's interesting with the sunshine laws, uh, and we, uh, our experience with the pandemic, that we end up with broader participation when virtual is possible by people who couldn't or wouldn't travel to, to be in the meetings. So I'm wondering what you discussed, since I wasn't able to participate either, on uh, whether you're going to continue to do a mixed mode even when you're meeting in person? Um, the stack meetings, uh, when we had them here, had a large number of non-stack members present. I've been watching the numbers between uh, the uh, TC meetings and the stack meetings, and TC meetings are like 30 to 40 people signed on. In the stack meetings, it's usually over 70. And so there are a lot of people participating. And I think one of the things I mentioned earlier about the fact that the report from all the people around the state, so you really get an, a, a feel of what's going on on a monthly basis in our transportation system. So um, I, didn't, I don't know what this, the CDOT regulations of people coming from around, but most of them are CDOT, CDOT people, not necessarily public. So. So do you plan to continue mixed mode even when you're meeting in person? We don't know because, or I don't know, because I'd like to see more in-person meetings, but the, the, you know, the stats are that people who are working at home like working at home. That 40% of the people working at home would rather quit their job 
if they're forced back into the office. And so I find that amazing, but you get comfortable doing things a certain way and trying to change people out of that mode, not that we got them trained, is going to be difficult. Although I see all you guys here, and that's really good. Other comments? Well, well, it sounds like that's going to be a discussion that you'll be having within the stack, because that's yeah. who has to make that decision, right? right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So I'm sure you'll have a lot of discussion about that at the next time. But it is. It, I'm really surprised that you only had three show up. I yes. would have thought that. Oh, the other person was from Dr. Cog. Oh, for heaven's sake! Yeah. Two far away places in Dr. Cog. Well, that that it's surprising to me, but. Um, It'll, as time goes on and people think more about getting out, maybe that'll change, but um, I'm sure your stack group will let you know exactly what they want. Or, right, or well, and, so and what we decide after yeah, that. Usually, and I'll yeah. bring that report to you next month. Yeah, because they're usually not real wishy-washy about things, that <laughs> stack group. I, I hope so. I, I like to have a, a lively discussion at every meeting if we can. Well, thanks for being here. Giving us your sort of worked. I gotta have practice with this. You bet. Well, I did a great job. Thank you. All right, that looks like the end of our reports, and on to uh, consent agenda. Our consent agenda consists of three items: resolution number one, approve regular meeting minutes of May 20th, 2021. Proposed resolution number two is an IGA approval of more than 750,000 expenditure. Uh, proposed resolution number three is Craig U.S. Highway 40 Frontage Road Devolution. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move to approve. I'll second, Ms. Kathy. Thank you. And discussion? Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none. Wait. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I just want to say I didn't have any corrections in the minutes this month. But, <laughs> but because I'm at this meeting, I expect to see the minutes from this meeting one more time. I, I don't know how we're going to manage without you. Somebody else has to take this roll on now, you know, and it's not me. <laughs> who's, the, who's the newest? Oh, Commissioner Hickey, you might have. <laughs> We've all stepped back. <laughs> all right. Any further discussion on the consent agenda motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Next is discuss and act on proposed resolution number four, condemnation, and that's uh, Steve Harrelson, please. Yes, this, uh, this action is proposed resolution four, which would authorize condemnation of the billboard structure in Larimer County on I-25 segment six. Uh, we discussed the issues um, at the workshop yesterday, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the commission? Jennifer, has anyone from the public contacted you to speak on this? No, and there's no one in the present today to do that. Okay. Motion is in order. I move that we approve uh, temporary resolution number four. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? All right. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Discuss and act on proposed resolution number five, 12th bud budget supplement of FY 2021. Jeff. Good morning. Uh, I'm requesting your approval of the 12th and final supplement to the fiscal year 21 budget. Uh, this month's supplement includes uh, two items requiring commission approval um, and two informational items. Uh, the two requests requiring commission approval relate to the US 85 settlement agreement with the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, the supplement includes two distinct actions this month uh, related to uh, completing that settlement agreement with Union Pacific. Um, the approval of, uh, of those two items will complete funding for the US 85 settlement package. Uh, the first action commits 13 million in TC program reserve funds to the, to the settlement 
providing most of the funding needed for the remaining payments due to the Union Pacific. Uh, the second action provides a $23.16 million loan from the PC program reserves, uh, the majority of which will provide the remaining construction funding for the Tekken interchange, part of that settlement agreement. Um, the construction phase of Tekken, Tekken is, is later anticipated to be funded through Senate Bill 267 Year 3, which would allow the repayment of the commission loan. Happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'll just ask you to consider a motion to approve. Discussion? Yeah. Commissioner Beatty? Gary Beatty. Um, I would propose an amendment to the resolution um, to increase the transfer from the reserve from 13 million to 18.1 million um, to give certainty for the Highway 52 project. Um, my understanding is that may get, still get funding possibly. But I'd like to give some certainty so that project can continue to be moved forward on Highway 52 um, to increase the transfer from reserves to eight, or up to 18.1 million from the 13. <coughs> Thank you. Is that a motion on the floor? Yes, it is. Second. Second. All right. Discussion? Commissioner Tebow? Just so the record's clear, we're, we're essentially increasing the $13 million by the $5 million plus and decreasing the $23.16 million by that same amount. And that was a yes from Jeff. That, that is my understanding. One number goes up by 5.1, one goes down by yeah. 5.1. Right. Yeah, my intent of that is just to guarantee that that project can go ahead and continue the design to get it uh, moving forward and have some certainty for that project. Okay, any further discussion? Commissioner Hickey? I would just ask uh, Commissioner Beebe, does there, is there some efficiency related to that motion? Yes, um, because this project includes other surface treatment that would be scheduled to be done. This is um, to um, add shoulders also along with that project to improve, improve the safety. Um, one of the projects had already been pulled due to on that same corridor um, currently that lost the shoulder portion of the overlay, so this one would try to continue the commitment that was made through our previous um, planning and the 10-year plan on that on that project. Thank you. Commissioner Vasquez? Just raised the question whether um, the region would do this project anyway with uh, next year's funding out of 267. Would that be the plan? <clears throat> Yes, we would do that project with Senate Bill 267 Year 4 funding um, if we had the funds to do it. Thank you. So it wouldn't be cut, it would be postponed. And that would it, keep it, the surface treatment and the shoulder work together? Yes, it's, it's, it was currently slated to go in, because of how the equity has balanced out, it was a Year 3 project. We have pushed it to a Year 4 project. So it was. It is planned to go in year four. The current proposal was to cancel that project to pay for part of Peck. So we we could deliver it in year four. You could not. We could. You could. Thank if you for the, the funds clarification. Were available. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Adams. Uh, thank you for the clarification and the explanation. I, I just would like to be on the record to say I'm not in favor of Commissioner Beatty's proposal given this project is not going to be uh, uh, totally eliminated. It's just uh, basically the way the proposal was originally presented. It appeared as though it would be cut, but now based on my understanding, it will be uh, considered as a part of, I think it's, did you say year four of Senate Bill 267? So um, I'll try to explain it. You know, we have, we have a 10-year list of projects. The first four years we've been really focusing on with Senate Bill 267. Each region has had a set planning total, and we've had a number of projects that make up that planning total. Um, 
when I was trying to figure out how to pay for Peckham, in essence, adding a project to the list, I had to cut projects off the list to balance the dollars. There are no additional dollars for the region to keep with that balance. So the proposal as it sits, the resolution as it sits in front of you, that project would be cut. It would not be a project delivered with Senate Bill 267. Could we reprioritize it at a later date with other projects with 260? Yes, um, but that would affect other projects also on the list. So um, can the region deliver it from, an, from, do we have resources to? Yes, but do we have funds as the proposal is written? No, um, we are get, giving up that project to pay for Peckham. My, my amendment would give you the funds. And your amendment would give us the funds to complete that project. Thank you. Other discussion before we take a roll call vote on this? All right. There's a motion and a second on the table. Uh, Herman, can you call roll and please vote when your name is called? Uh, just, uh, Madam Chair, just clarification. We're, get, we're, we're voting on Commissioner Beatty's That's amendment. the motion in front of us. Commissioner Gifford. Aye. Commissioner Stanton. Aye. Commissioner Adams. Aye. Commissioner Brackey. Oh, she's gone. Oh. Commissioner Vasquez. No. Aye. 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 Yes. Yes. So that um, motion passes you, uh, with a vote to, what did you say, eight to two with one abstention. All right, thank you very much. That disposes of this resolution. Madam Chair. Yes. Since we voted on the amendments, uh, if there are no other amendments, I request that the original resolution be severed. And the severance would occur with the loan line of the US 85 settlement, so that that would be voted on separately from the rest of the resolution. Okay, so we would that adopted the amendment, so we haven't adopted the resolution. We haven't adopted the resolution. Right. So you are you making a motion to just requesting that that line just be requesting, severed, which All is right. within the chair's discretion to allow or disallow. Let's do that then. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. All right, so we'll take the first, and maybe Herman, you can clarify what it is we're voting on to begin with. Yeah. I, I think your first vote would be uh, the severed uh -huh. amendment, so taking that piece out. All right, so we need a, uh, we'd need a motion to sever, and that's your motion, Commissioner Well, my, my request is to sever, you can sever as the chair, and then the severed portion, we can we can adopt or not adopt. So if somebody wishes to adopt the severed portion, we just need to make a motion to adopt it as it has been amended. Okay. And then I can argue against it. <laughs> and to clarify, what's the what's the severed piece? We'll vote on that severed piece first, I believe. Yeah. That's the loan. All right, so we're severing the loan from the resolution so that the resolution doesn't have two parts, which is um, a TC funding and a loan for the second piece of that. I think you, so in the table, there's two pieces. There's the now, I think, 18.1 million that does not say loan underneath it, and then there's the 23 million minus 5 million, 0.06. That number, <laughs> I 
is is the second vote, and that's the loan piece. All right. So in order to and Commissioner Hickey, just to beat the horse, um, so the, we would vote on a payment which is a payment not encumbered by loan status, so that the money still flows, right? Otherwise, the severed piece is only the loan status of that payment. Is that correct? We don't want to eliminate that pay that line item entirely. We rather want to either cloak it as a loan or not. Is that true? right? That's that's the purpose of the severance. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So properly before us would be the chair's acceptance to um, sever those two pieces. Then the motion would be made to provide funding. Yes, I, I think I think what we're, you're doing is you're severing um, the second part. So you're going to vote separately on a 20. I'm sorry, now an 18, right. 18 point zero six million dollar loan. I think you'll vote on it as a loan, and then um, certain commissioners, if they're so inclined, can vote no on that portion. No, I don't think the loan is for 1806. I think the loan is for 23. No, no, we're. I think we're voting on the amended resolution now. All right. So give me that language. Yep. So the, to the severed portion to vote on, I, I move to sever and vote on the loan to approve a loan of 18.06 million from con the Trent Reserve fund ah. to fund it, right? So that's my motion is to loan 18.06 million from reserves. Uh, thank you. That that that's exactly right. Thank you. All right, we need a second to that. Uh, can I have clarification? Yes. Yeah. Are we voting on the amount? Well, uh, let me second it first. I'll second that, and then yeah. you discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Discussion. So we're we voting only on the characterization of whether it is a, a unencumbered transfer or a loan, but the amount is uh, immaterial, and then we will vote on the full slate of funding that's in the resolution. I'm trying to understand what we're voting on. Yeah, the, the way I understand it is the posture that Commissioner Beatty has given us is that a yes vote means that you want to lend money out of the program reserve in the amount of 18 plus million dollars. A no vote would be you don't want to do that. If that as a loan, as a, as a loan. Uh, so at, at all. So it's not an amendment; it's a severing. So you're voting on those two lines separately. So if you vote yes on it, then then to to strike it, you're you're saying you don't want that. Well, now I'm just no. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're getting wrapped up here. I think we need some clarification. I, I, I thought that we were going to vote on whether or not we wanted to create two, uh, two items to vote on. One was Commissioner Tebow's notion that we would sever the, the loan portion of this and vote on it separately. And then I assume that creates a discussion of whether we wanted to treat it as a loan to be payable back by Region 4, right. or broadly spread throughout the entirety of CDOT as the past practice was. Yes. So that's what I thought we were going to vote on. And the number, I thought, again, and I'm confused on this part, I thought the number was still 23 because I thought what we were doing with the 5.1 was basically just saying it was no longer going to be cut, but we were going to fund it out of the reserves, which meant it went to 18.1, but the 23 stayed in place. Mm. Yeah, this is amended. Okay. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> It's actually really simple. It's the parting gift. 
So I'm, I'm going to be voting no so that everybody knows on this severed portion because I don't want the $18 million to be characterized as a loan. And if it is characterized as a loan as it is presented to us, I don't want that money to go. It is severed. It's just whether or not you want the loan of 18 plus million or not. Yeah. And I don't. And I think everybody else does. The idea of severing simply meant that um, I get a chance to vote no on the idea of a loan and the amount of the loan, which has now been amended to 18 million plus. Okay, and I appreciate the commission's um, gracious uh, um, graciousness in allowing me to do that. I, I just don't prefer to go on record as having the money out of the reserve be money that is lent money. I want it to just be given. Okay? So the posture of Commissioner Beatty's motion is basically he apparently wants this line to stay as a loan and for the $18 million as amended by his amendment. So I don't want to do that. So his yet he will he would he'd be I think calling for a vote of yes right to support his idea and I would be calling for a vote of no to support my idea. Then after we decide on this severed portion, which I predict will pass, then we just pass the resolution in its entirety as it was amended by Commissioner Beatty. This is on the severed portion. Right. Commissioner Gifford? Yes. Commissioner Stanton? Yes. Commissioner Adams? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Brackey is excused. Yes. Commissioner Vasquez? Yes. Commissioner Zink? Yes. Commissioner Hickey? Yes. Commissioner Thibault? Yes. Commissioner Beatty? Yes. Commissioner Hall? Yes. Chair Stewart. Sorry, Thank that you. that motion passes nine to one with one absentee. All right. Now I would move on the main motion of the resolution as amended with the eighteen point one million to come out of reserve and 18.06 to be a loan from the Blue Chips. All right. Further discussion? Are you sure you don't want to say something else, Bill? There well, you go. I, was, <laughs> I was hesitant too, but I want everybody to understand that I so appreciate the posture of that. And I have to vote no on the resolution now because the part that I wanted out is a major part of the resolution. But I want to let everybody know that I support reluctantly giving the railroad a payoff. I prefer not to do that, but I think we're kind of trapped in that. I believe that there's a moral obligation for this commission to give um, loan-free money to Region 4, um, and I've explained that to you in our various conversations. Um, I don't feel that the reserve will be impacted on a short or medium term any worse than they are now under this particular approach. And in the long term, probably our reserves will jump up to the, to the balance that we have as a commission desires. And I do support the uh, Senate Bill 267 highway funding. But again, I just can't support the resolution because the significant portion of it deals with a loan that I don't think um, should be made to um, Region 4. So thank you very much for your patience in helping me get through this. Um, and that's all I have to say. Well, thank you for complicating this 
immensely, but with the right intention and um, voting your conscience on this, we really appreciate the discussion we've had around this. And uh, we'll, uh, I think now, take the final vote. Is that right? All right, we'll do roll call one more time. Commissioner Gifford? Yes. Commissioner Stanton? Yes. Commissioner Adams? Yes. Commissioner Brackey, uh, absent? Yes. 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 So that passes nine to one with one absentee. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate getting through that. Appreciate your indulgence. And uh, Region 4, yeah, you're able to take care of your uh, US 85 Union Pacific issue. So thank you very much. Thanks for bringing this to the commission. And thanks for the robust discussion on this. Appreciate that. All right, moving on, we'll discuss and act on proposed resolution number six, which is the 11th budget amendment of FY 2021. Thank you. Um, 11th and final budget amendment for fiscal year 21. Um, the budget amendment includes uh, two requests, um, or I'm sorry, three requests. Uh, the first is a request to increase the department's uh, FTE cap by 14 posi positions. Uh, this was the subject of a uh, workshop yesterday. Uh, this includes 10 positions uh, needed to expand to support new funding, uh, including federal stimulus funds, uh, newer expanded uh, programs, and new requirements, uh, in large part following from the passage of Senate Bill 260. Uh, the request also includes four labor relations positions necessitated by the recent passage of the Colorado Partnership for Quality Jobs and Services Act. Uh, the second request is a request to increase the department's FTE cap by four positions to increase the HPTE express lanes tolling operations staff to support our expanding uh, express lanes network. The third request is a request to approve 359,252 uh, from the TC program reserve to cover the cost of issuance for the Burnham Yard financing transaction uh, that was executed last month uh, by, by the HPTE on behalf of CDOT. Per the IAA between CDOT and HPTE, the cost of issuance for that transaction is to be borne uh, by the department, so we're requesting that you allocate funds uh, to reimburse uh, HPTE for the cost of issuance. Um, the, uh, uh, finally, the third amendment updates the amount for the third tranche of Senate Bill 267 COPs from the par amount of $500 million that was originally programmed to the final closing amount of $620.6 million. I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'd request you consider a motion to approve. Are there any questions? Commissioner Zink? In the discussion that we had yesterday, it, it sounded to me like, do I have this right, that some of those positions may not be permanent. And there, so when you advertise for those positions, it's going to be clear that this is. Uh, you are you are correct, and um, we did not make that distinction at this point, just simply because we are working through. I think some of the decisions about what is most appropriate as term and what is most appropriate as permanent. But I think the intention absolutely is that where we have positions that we think are um, are, are really serving a. a a short-term purpose over the next two to four years, which is during we a period of um, expanded delivery, we will uh, we will fill those as terms. Learned that, yeah, you say it's it's not full, but you'll keep that padding, so to speak. And but so I just want to make that clear that that's our understanding. That is our understanding, and I think and Herman and I have not discussed this, but I I can tell you that we'll we'll and we it's possible we could even amend it at a later date when we figure that out to clarify term versus permanent. But um, certainly I think it is our intent that if it is uh, a, um, a short-term need that we not, that not result in a, uh, a, an actual permanent position, that that position um, be retired at the appropriate point in time. Mr. Hall. Well, I will support this, but I really have heartburn over approving so many FTEs without a number applied, just to let you know that. I mean, we've always had numbers uh, with it, and I understand the need to get out and 
advertise and, and talk about some are permanent, some are not, but I really have a lot of heartburn over no numbers being applied. And and I should probably clarify because I that the I think the question of term versus permanent is probably more of the discussion for next month. And I think when we come next month month we can have that clarification. I think that the uh, the four labor relations positions, I think most of the positions this month are going to be permanent. I think the exception uh, is probably one or two of the positions that might be associated with the recovery office, which could be a, a temporary uh, office. And we did not make that distinction here. That's correct. But I think um, the rest of the positions this month would be permanent. And I think next month we would make that distinction for the positions that we bring to you next month. I think that, just to follow up on that, I think the cost of what these FTE positions are is unknown to us. And so to ask us to approve the um, pursuant of um, these FTEs without knowing what the cost on the other side of that is, 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 is what is confusing and a little bit of, um, uh, it's, it's unlike how we have approved budgetary items before. Uh, and, I, and I think that is a, a fair point. Um, I think we accelerated some positions this month in the interest of moving very quickly. And I think we intend to bring a more complete picture, including um, any budgetary changes that are required of these positions uh, the, as we finalize that package in um, uh, next month. Um, as Director Liu indicated, in many instances, these positions will not require a budget action. Um, the reason being that, we, that sufficient budget is already in place for these positions, and not in every case, but in most cases, um, either already part of the capital construction funding, the funding for the underlying program, or in many cases, there's a cost savings uh, where essentially we have funds uh, in place that would, in the absence of approval of FTEs, uh, be used as personal and professional services budget for outsourcing those functions. Question, uh, Commissioner Vesquez. Is it your expectation that these positions will be filled before the next commissioner's meeting? I, I would say from the perspective of timing, that's, and Herman can jump in on this. They would not be filled, but yeah. they would I would anticipate most or all of them would be advertised, and to advertise it, we would need a job classification, which comes with a, with a range of salary. So, so we would not have it filled, but we would know those numbers and can provide it next month. But I think all of those job classifications, because many of these are new positions, um, we've not determined what those are yet. That is correct. So a uh, motion is in order. <laughs> Sorry. I'll second that motion. Uh, yeah, the motion I haven't made yet, that's great. <laughs> Your motion is to approve resolution number? It is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm so used to the Zoom button. I'm sorry. I'm still struggling with the microphone. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All, right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That uh, is, well, it's approved unanimously with one absentee. Is that right? Yeah. Um, the next one is discuss and act on proposed resolution number seven, which is transportation asset management, known as TAM, planning budgets, funding cap uh, request. And we have Toby in front of us, Toby Manthe. Good morning. I am Toby Manthe with DTD's Asset Management Program. I'm here in support of resolution number seven. Fiscal year 2024-25 asset management planning budgets and funding cap. Um, as a quick reminder, these are planning budgets for our 12 asset classes. Um, they don't become final till the year they're actual budgets, so you'll have the opportunity to modify 
uh, funding should you choose to do that before they become actual budgets. Um, wanted to say we certainly appreciate the robust discussion on this uh, issue yesterday, and um, we would appreciate your support of a motion to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? We had pretty pretty robust discussion. We appreciate that as well. Uh, so a motion is in order. I'll move to approve resolution number seven. Second. Uh, I'd just like to make a few comments. Um, with with this, this is one with our asset management. I think we need to consider this a floor um, with new funding sources and things coming forward instead of a cap. Um, so in the planning process and as we move to actually the budgeting of those dollars, um, I would consider hopefully our staff can look at how these projects could be expanded if there is additional funding to improve our ongoing maintenance of our facilities to improve our, our long-term delivery of maintaining the system in addition to our capital construction projects and everything else that we're doing. So um, just a comment on I hate saying a cap when we're so underfunded by 400 million um, on our asset management dollars. Um, we're still facing a shortfall on ever trying to meet those goals of maintaining our, our targets for our assets. So just comment for the public and to be on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? All right, seeing none. All in favor of resolution, proposed resolution number seven, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Any abstention? All right, that passes unanimously with one commissioner absent. Next is discuss and act on proposed resolution number eight, state infrastructure bank rate approval. Again, um, I'm requesting your approval of the state infra infrastructure bank interest rate uh, for the six month period beginning July 1. The staff recommendation is to maintain the current rate of 2% for the next six months and to maintain the current origination fee schedule which the commission can choose and often does choose to waive uh, when we actually have uh, state infra infrastructure bank applications. I'm happy to answer any questions otherwise I'd request you consider a motion to approve. Mm -hmm. What is the origination rate Jeff just for my education? Sure. So it is outlined in the memo, and it is a variable rate depending on the size of the loan. So the uh, origination fee schedule uh, is 1% for loan proceeds over 1 million, uh, 0.75 between a million uh, and up to 2.5, 0.5 for loans over 2.5 up to 5 million, and a quarter uh, percent on loan proceeds over 5 million. Typically, and generally, that's been waived pretty much 100% of the time to 50% of the time? What's I would say the majority of the time it's waived. And my understanding is that the origination fee schedule exists um, uh, or was originally put into place uh, in, an, in uh, anticipation of wanting to have a way to recover costs if there were an application that, incur that resulted in significant costs. An example of that may be a particularly complicated application where we uh, say, uh, seek the uh, advice of our uh, outside financial counsel. Um, we typically have not seen uh, applications that we have, uh, we have deemed uh, uh, required uh, significant staff time or, uh, or outside counsel. And so typically we do not bring to you a, when we ask for an approval of a, of a SIB bank loan, we do not bring to you a recommendation to apply the origination fee schedule, but we have the ability to if we had a situation where we incurred some significant costs. And the only other point I would make is, obviously uh, with the news from the last couple of days from the Fed, rates are rising. So, but I'm comfortable if you're talking about this is only for six months? That is correct. That is on, this is only for the next six months. Um, and I'll, I'll also note that the, uh, the commission has the ability to change the rate at any point in time. I think our, uh, per policy, I think our, uh, our minimum cadence is every six months. Um, but uh, uh, at this point, you're only approving it through the, uh, through the end of December of this uh, upcoming fiscal year. Thank you. Further discussion? All right. The motion is in order. <coughs> so moved. I'll second, second the motion. <coughs> Thank you. 
we have a second and a motion, a second, a motion and a second for the discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, please vote aye. Aye. Those opposed? Any abstentions? All right, unanimous. <coughs> unanimous approval with one absent. When we're on Zoom, I can just mute myself <coughs> when I have to cough, so I apologize. <coughs> Discuss and act on proposed resolution number nine, Floyd Hill Project Delivery Method. Good morning, Paul Jacitas, CDOT Region 1 Director. On behalf of the Region 1 staff and project team, I am pleased to introduce proposed resolution number nine, which uh, was dis discussed at length yesterday at the, the commission workshop. And just a reminder, it was the um, selection of the alternative delivery method, construction manager, general contractor, otherwise known as DMDC, contracting method, alternative delivery for the I-70 Floyd Hill to Veterans Tunnels uh, project. So with that, um, I am happy to take any questions, but uh, requesting that you consider a motion to approve. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Motion is in order. I move. I move. Oh, We've got a, a motion by Commissioner Vasquez. And who was the second? Commissioner Adams. Thank you. Other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone in opposition? Any abstentions? All right, that approved unanimously with one absentee. Thank you. Discuss and act on proposed resolution number 10, 2021 raise application, and that's Herman. Yep, thank you. Um, so we're starting to sort out our raise applications, the federal grant um, that's due July 12th. It's about a billion dollars available. Uh, the request can be between five and 25 million. So we have, we have one application that we're asking for ourselves. It's for a, a mobility hub in Grand Junction, but it's actually a little bit more than that. We're calling it the multimodal options for a vibrant, equitable West Slope. So we're, <laughs> so we're move. So we're bringing in not only the mobility hub in Grand Junction, but also a couple of projects in Glenwood and one in Rifle to really tie it together, similar to what we did with the MAMSIP project in Colorado Springs. We tied a, a few military-related projects together and packaged it up. We're doing that with our partners in Rifle and Glenwood. Uh, it's about a $30 million project. We're not asking for any dollars from the Transportation Commission on that one. We have existing dollars, and the locals will come with some match as well. Still sorting that out, but we feel like we're we're in good shape monetarily on that one. And PD 703 says we don't need to take that one to you for approval, um, but we tend to do that anyway with with any projects. So you are at least aware of the projects that we're going for. The the other one is the Amtrak Southwest Chief La Junta route um, uh, re rehabilitation. I can't read my own writing. Um, program. It re replaces the last 34 miles of track for the Southwest Chief route. It's about a $23 million project. We think we're still sorting out the, the matches. The commitment from the commission traditionally on these grants, and, and we've gotten several, uh, this is a Trinidad application, but the uh, Southwest Colorado, Southeast Colorado has gotten several of these grants, um, Tiger and others, uh, and the commission um, commits to a billion, or a billion, a million dollars to wow. to match that uh, to match that grant. So we're asking for that commitment. And again, just like all grants, um, it's not a designation of funds, regardless of whether the whether the grant comes through. If the grant comes through, then you've committed that million dollars. If it does not, then that project doesn't have that those dollars. So uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, but those are the the projects we're looking at. Thank you, Commissioner Vasquez. You identified the million for the Trinidad. Is there any money committed for the Grand Junction project? There, there is, but it's through existing dollars that we have, whether it be 267 or other project okay. dollars that that have already been designated for that area. Thank you. Um, so we don't have to come to the commission for additional. Mr. Hall, um, this is this is, is 
Number one, I'll make the motion to uh, approve resolution number 10 for the raise application. And then I'll just, we can have a few in a second and then we'll discuss. Anybody want to second that? Second. Okay. Uh, so just for all of you, uh, if you remember, you approved a $500,000 planning grant for that multi, and that's part of the money that is from the local areas. So there is there is money that you've already committed, but it's it's already there. So just want to make that clarification. You you've already you've already done a lot to help us with that. And this is a, a great application for a raised grant. It, it it's one thing that I think that we all appreciate is that we're always looking for ways to bring more dollars to the table, and finding those specific projects that fit the criteria that will give you the best chance of getting that grant is a yeoman's job. And I know that we've had a lot of staff members and um, Jamie and, uh, and uh, Julie have both worked diligently on this and it's been in flux for the last month trying to figure out how to position this to get that money. So it's hard work to get those grants, but when you get them, it's a windfall, so it's great. I have just one more comment. Yep. If you don't mind, I one more comment. I'm really enthused about this because if it comes together as I'm hoping it will, and as I'm pushing the Grand Junction City Council, we will have a true multimodal. Uh, it's, we'll have the rail, um, Bustang, Greyhound, and the local uh, transit. And so we'll, we will be a much smaller version of Union Station. Yes. <laughs> And that makes me really excited. So thank you for your support. When we get this, we'll all come out and visit you, Kathy. Yeah. All right. Um, there's a motion and a second on the table. Uh, any final discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Anyone abstaining from the vote? It's a unanimous approval with one absentee. Thank you. Discuss and act on... Resolution number 11, Transportation Commission Party Status for Air Quality Control Commission Greenhouse Gas Rulemaking. And I'll look to Commissioner Thibault. That should just be withdrawn. It should be withdrawn. Yes, ma'am. All right. We're going to withdraw that one. Next is discuss and act on proposed resolution number 12, acknowledgement of new chair, vice chair, and secretary, and I'll turn that over to Commissioner Vasquez. Yes, at the last meeting, um, three of us, uh, were asked to form a nominating committee, Commissioner Adams, uh, Commissioner Brackey, who's not here, and myself. And we both had a learning curve to climb, uh, what the nominating committee was empowered to do and able to do. Uh, we decided to make this uh, as open and transparent a process as possible. So between us, we contacted every commissioner to solicit their input first to give us some insight on how this had been done before us, what the traditions were, uh, what was in writing and what wasn't in writing, and to solicit um, suggestions. Um, that was a learning curve for all of us, and we have followed tradition and are very pleased to announce the vice chair as the new chair and Don Stanton as the vice chair. So. Thank you very much to all of you for your help in our process and to the new chair and vice chair for the efforts that they're going to be undertaking. Wonderful. So now we'll need a resolution. Uh, we'll need a motion to approve resolution number 12. But a little self-serving. You may need to include a secretary. I'm sorry. I'm so... But you can choose whoever you want. I are. am so sorry. Uh, yeah, I keep listening. So um, maybe I'll clarify a little bit more. Um, so the tradition of vice chair becoming chair is not written down anywhere that we could find, nor is it written down that Herman would be secretary, but we would be crazy to put forward anybody else for the position that you execute so flawlessly for all of us. So I apologize for failing to mention that but uh, we are nominating Herman to continue to serve as secretary. Thank you for bringing me up short. <laughs> I, I move we approve uh, resolution 12 as proposed. Second. Second. 
Is it too late to back out? Yeah. <laughs> I just have a. If I could make one more comment, one of the things we explored, as many of you know, is whether the three individuals who were named to the nominating committee were in a timeout box. That is, whether they could nominate one of their own or not. Um, and we decided to follow the tradition of being in the timeout box. So. And I would suggest if any, and I think we had this conversation, if anyone who is not in the nominating committee wished to be uh, considered that they would just withdraw from the nominating committee. But you guys were all, were all good sports about um, taking on this job, and we appreciate it. It was. Yes, thank you. I, I don't have a motion to sever anything here, but I, oh. <laughs> I would like to congratulate the nominating committee for the work they do, because that is a very important committee. And um, I, I'm happy to hear there's um, discussion about our traditions and how we approach things. Um, but I'd also like to congratulate um, our new chair, uh, Commissioner Hall. I've said this before, that there's nothing sweeter than Commissioner Hall except for the peaches and Grand Junction. So oh. That I want to be on the record again. And for uh, Commissioner Stanton, uh, welcome aboard. Uh, it's going to be, I'm sure, a real exciting time for you and good luck to you. I know that you're very interested in being a leader of the commission and will do a, a, an outstanding job. And for Herman, this is your last chance to to run away <laughs> because you've got your work cut out for you and you do a great job. Thank you for, your, for the work that you've done. Thank you. Further comments before we take the vote? Uh, I'd just like to say we thought about a raise for the chair and the vice chair, but we we felt that there was no amount of money they would be willing to accept for taking this on. Yeah. Well, you could, have, you could have thrown it out. You know, you could have thrown out a number. Right, Don? <laughs> okay. All right. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposition? Any abstentions? No abstention? No. Too late. Yes. The only reason I... Uh, board you with our process is it's not written down anywhere and I thought as a matter of record it would be helpful to get it into the minutes so that the future nominating committee has benefit of some of our learning curve. Thank you. So um, we have a affirmative vote from everyone. It's unanimous approval with one absentee. And I can see Commissioner Beattie would like to make a comment. Just one of the one pieces of that nominating is the historical history is also that they usually try to have a chair and vice chair of urban and of rural mm -hmm. uh, type representation just to get that into the record and yeah great comment thank you thank you Con congratulations uh, commissioner hall and uh, commissioner stanton and well, thank you very You're much. In great and, hands. Well, thank you very much, and and it'll be really hard to fill the shoes of Karen and Sydney and 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 Shannon and all of you. And Bill, you've done such a good job. And and the the before I've been here, I've been in the commission for six years, and all the chairmen have been so good and have done such a good job. And it's been a it's the the process of having a, a chairman from the more outlying rural areas and, and then a vice chair from the, the inner corridor has always worked out really well for the state because it is a very large state and it's very complicated. So I hope we'll keep that tradition of, of doing that. And I appreciate your support and I look forward to trying to do the very best job I possibly can for you as chair. I will do my best, I promise you. Thank you. We know we're in good hands, thanks. So much for accepting for accepting that position. Uh, I think we'll go on now to the recognition of departing commissioners. Uh, while we, but I get to be first. Oh, you get to be. I'll first. be first. Okay. All right, you go. You go you, first. You can you can do yours. But first of all, I would like to um, be be the one to thank.
Karen so much, and I know all of you feel that way, and we've all we've all talked it, about it a great deal. So I have the official gavel that has her name on it that talks about being the Transportation Commission Chair for 2021. And I wish there was a way to put on there where we could talk about the fact that she had to do it almost all virtually because it was such an unusual year. But Karen, it's with great pleasure that I present you with this gavel. And the reason they don't give it to her ahead of time, because she might use it on us. But here is her gavel. Well, I, I think Commissioner Hall has it absolutely right. They don't give it to you ahead of time because they really don't want you to use it. <laughs> no, great, you'll use it. <laughs> but thank you. It's it's been a pleasure to do this, and uh, yeah, it's uh, been an interesting. The thing about it was, you know, you think you can't be resilient, but you can be resilient, right? <laughs> and you you wonder how are we going to do this? How's it going to work? And yet it does work, and. You find a way to learn new skills, and that old dog new tricks really applies to me. <laughs> and so I do appreciate it. So, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. So, um, recognition of, of departing commissioners. Uh, so, I'll just say a couple of the thing, other things that we don't write down. <laughs> um, one of which is the irony of giving the gavel. To the, to the chair after they're no longer the chair. Um, but two other things that we like to do, and I appreciate actually Commissioner Beatty reminding me of one of them last month. Um, we like to have senior staff and commissioners uh, sign a hard hat for departing commissioners. And then we also have our RTDs and Jennifer work together to choose a photo of an important project that maybe you participated in or really cared about or, or helped oversee uh, during your time as as commissioners, so we have photos that were uh, with the, the background signed by your fellow commissioners. So those are two small ways to say thank you for the service that you all have provided to us. I, th I think each of you will have to stand up here and show us your picture so we can see it, and then you can make some comments on the appropriateness of the picture. Yeah. So, we'll, Commissioner Tebow, let's start with you.
that Shannon had to sit through an awful lot of really angry, contentious meetings, and so <laughs> you were used to it. But you did have you you really had some tough meetings, I know. This is the 16550 interchange that is still in progress, but I think it's been, it was a great example of the leverage that you can get when the, when the county and the southern Ute tribe, and the, they all put in some, some serious money, and then I just got to talk to the commission and say, you know, we just need another, and, and this project will happen. This is the, the biggest project. Not a, more importantly, now there isn't a bridge to nowhere. There's a bridge to somewhere, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, because now now there's really <laughs> I see Region Five down there smiling because now there's a bridge to somewhere. <laughs> there. Well, thank you, thank you for that, and we're going to miss you guys a lot. So appreciate all the work you've put in all these years and uh, set the bar high for the rest of us. Thank you. Other matters, anything else? All right, we're going to adjourn this meeting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we're going to call to order the Bridge Enterprise Board of Directors meeting. Director Gifford. Aye. Director Stanton. Here. Director Adams. Here. Director Brackey. Here. Director Vasquez. Here. Director Zink? Here. Director Hickey? Here. Director Tebow? Here. Director Beatty? Here. Vice Chair Hall? Here. Chair Stewart? Here. Thank you. Public comments, were there any public comments provided? No? Seeing none in the audience, we'll move on to consent agenda, proposed resolution BE1 to approve the regular meeting minutes of May 2021. I'll look to uh, Commissioner uh, Zink. I move for approval. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Any abstention? All right, unanimous with one absent. <clears throat> Discuss and act on proposed resolution BE2, Bridge Enterprise 8th budget supplement for FY21. Oh, uh, I'm requesting your approval of the eighth and final supplement to the fiscal year 21 Bridge Enterprise budget. Um, this month's supplement includes two items. Uh, the first is a request to establish the construction phase budget for a bridge replacement to State Highway 92 over the Gunnison River uh, in Region 3 with 11,193,500 in faster bridge funds. Uh, this is a top tier structure in the January 21 prioritization plan. Uh, the second request uh, is to increase the budget uh, for conceptual design for the I-70 westbound over Polk Creek project. Uh, which is a BE eligible structure, part of the larger I-70 uh, Vail Pass Safety and Operations uh, Improvement Project, also in Region 3. Uh, the request is for 500,000 in faster bridge funds, and this is also a top tier structure. Happy to answer any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll just ask the motion. I move, questions? I move for approval of, of resolution BE 2. A second. Thank you. Any discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposition? Any abstention? That's approved and unanimously with one absentee. Thank you. Discuss and act on proposed resolution BE3, BE Asset Recognition and Transfer. Jared? Hi, board. Uh, Jared Escobel here with Bridge Enterprise. Sorry I can't be there in person. I'm off this week celebrating my oldest son's uh, engagement. So we're in Mexico. So thank you for your understanding of not being there. Um, per the faster legislation, new bridges constructed to replace existing deficient bridges using BE funds become assets then of the BE program. 
Um, under the current accounting policy, CDOT retains the ownership of the old existing bridge until it is taken out of service when the project's complete. The B board is then asked to approve a resolution to acknowledge the new structure and the old structure then uh, gets removed from the inventory. We do this annually. So every June, we typically do this. And this year we have four bridges that are included in that asset acknowledgement request. The four bridges are the two I-25 northbound and uh, southbound at Butte Creek, I-25 southbound over Draw, and US-36 over North Fork. All, of, all four of these bridges in fiscal year 2021 were open to traffic. We respectfully ask the board to consider a motion to approve a resolution to acknowledge these four structures as bridge enterprise assets. Thank you, any questions? Motion is in order. I so move. Thank you, motion second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Any abstention? Seeing none, that's unanimous, unanimous vote for approval with one absentee. Discuss and act on proposed resolution BE4, the resolution to acknowledge um, Director Hall as the new chair, Director Stanton as the new vice chair, and um, the ongoing secretary um, position for um, Henry Stockinger. Herman, Henry. You know where that comes from, right? Uh, imagine when Henry Sobinet was a commissioner. I wasn't Herman for like four years. I'm sure that's true. And you know, RTD is Henry Stoffelkamp, and I must have a phone call with him every single day. So I really apologize. Good thing I'm off this table. All right. With that correction, is there a motion? Thank you. Motion is second. Any further discussion? With my apologies. All right. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposition? Any abstention? Thank you. It's unanimously acknowledged with uh, one absentee. Any other matters? Don't think so. We're going to adjourn this meeting. We're going to take a 10 minute break so that people who want to, uh, to want to leave can do that. But we have a very a good presentation on SB 260 B-Bill overview that we'd like you to stay for if you're able to stay for that. Um, let's go ahead and take a break. Jennifer, are there lunches in the back or no? Okay. All right. Yes, we're adjourned. Thank you. Jeff, how long do you think a presentation will take? Uh huh. Questions, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, and we should have lunches for people too who want to leave and who want to stay. Yeah.
commissioners, I think lunch has just arrived. So if you want to grab your lunch back there. And Vince, I think we have one for you too.
Okay. Um, if everyone who's uh, here will take a seat. If you don't, haven't grabbed your lunch, grab your lunches. And uh, we'll turn it over to Rebecca and Jeff to give us um, a great presentation on C60. Okay. Um, so uh, Rebecca and I will tag team on this. And um, we, this is a, a presentation that we've now uh, provided a couple different times to SAC uh, last Friday um, to uh, industry on Monday. And uh, it requires a little bit of adaptation for each audience. Um, so I think the, the commission is, is pretty well versed, so I'll probably skim over um, detail in some places. And, and, um, and really, I think what, I, I, what we probably want to focus on today is um, I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit on the financial piece and look a little bit more specifically at kind of what are the dollars flowing to CDOT, um, when do they flow to CDOT, and what are sort of the, uh, the, the commitments associated with those dollars? Because it's, it's not as though every dollar coming in the door is flexible for us to uh, go uh, build a new project with. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, commitments to uh, programs articulated in the bill. Um, we have debt service. Um, so. I'll, the, I'll focus really on trying to zoom in a little bit more on kind of the high level, uh, what does it mean for CDOT uh, from, a, from a financial perspective. And then I think Rebecca will zoom in a little bit more on the uh, planning uh, and environmental requirements. Um, and then I think we'll conclude just by touching on a little bit of sort of where do we go from here, what's, uh, what's, what's next in terms of uh, decisions for commission, and what's next in terms of some of the things that we're going to have to tackle uh, as a staff, and, and a big part of that, I think, is actually what we, we started uh, discussing uh, uh, yesterday and, and partially addressed today, which is some of the FTE questions. So um, I will, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start us off here, and um, please feel free to stop me at any point with uh, questions. Okay, so um, let's um, go ahead one more slide, uh, um, Jennifer, thank you. So. I think I'll, I'll start here and I'll, I'll kind of provide the, the 30,000 foot view, but again, I think you're, you're all fairly familiar with this. So, um, so the, uh, the bill, uh, uh, Senate Bill 260, uh, in total provides about $5.4 in funding um, over the course of the next 11 years through fiscal year 32. Um, it doesn't sunset in 32. Um, it's just simply that uh, uh, from a forecasting perspective, uh, we looked out 10 years uh, on the fee revenue. Um, since that doesn't begin until 23, that's really an 11-year window. Um, and uh, the fee schedules themselves uh, had uh, a, a fixed rate schedule that went out to fiscal year 32 and then is just indexed to inflation going forward. So, um, so not, a, not a sunset in 32, but that's kind of the time horizon for phasing in the fees, and that's the time horizon we, that was used in forecasting the revenue generation. So, about 5.4 billion um, over the course of the next 11 years through fiscal year 32. Um, about 3.8 billion of that is provided by the new fees, and about 1.6 billion of that is uh, is provided uh, through a combination of upfront stimulus dollars and ongoing general fund transfers. Um, I think everyone is pretty familiar with uh, what the fees are, but I'll, I'll quickly just kind of recap that. Um, the uh, there's a road usage fee and a bridge and tunnel enterprise fee. Uh, those um, uh, essentially sit on top of the existing gas tax or per gallon fee. Um, there is an EV equalization fee um, that sits on top of the existing EV registration fee. And it was designed to um, relatively approximate for the average driver uh, the, the average amount of uh, additional revenue so that they were paying roughly the same as the driver of an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, there is a TNC fee. Uh, that TNC fee is uh, a fee of about 30 cents per ride that would be applied to uh, transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft um, and uh, has a discounted fare uh, for pooled rides. Um, there is a delivery fee. Uh, that's a 27 cent uh, per delivery fee that would be assessed on uh, online uh, orders. So that would apply to everything from your Amazon package coming and, and you'd, you'd see an additional 27 cents on your, your Amazon bill for that delivery um, to uh, a, a food order delivery, for example, through, uh, through Grubhub. 
Um, and then finally, there are a few changes to the already existing uh, rental car fee that was in, in the, uh, the FASTER bill of uh, 2009, 2009? Um, that uh, essentially has the effect of just uh, expanding the, the uh, application of that existing fee, uh, and uh, as a result, generates uh, a bit more revenue out of that, uh, that FASTER fee, uh, that existing FASTER fee. Um, of all the dollars, about uh, one point, a little over 1.4 billion, our enterprise. Um, the bill creates three new enterprises um, focused on electrification. Uh, one of those is uh, is housed in the Colorado Energy Office. One is housed in the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and one would be housed in CDOT. And the one housed in CDOT uh, is the Clean Transit Enterprise, which, as its name suggested, is focused would be focused on electrification. Uh, of the transit fleet. Um, additionally, there is a, so that's the first new enterprise created at CDOT, the clean transit enterprise. Uh, the bill also creates a second new enterprise, which is the non-attainment enterprise. Um, that would be focused on, uh, on uh, providing dedicated funding for uh, projects or project elements, elements of projects uh, that uh, have uh, air quality mitigation qualities uh, and would be focused on the nine attainment area in the front range. Um, the bill modifies our existing bridge enterprise. Uh, it expands the scope of that. So uh, in addition to what's already eligible uh, uh, for rated bridges, uh, it would also make eligible uh, maintenance on existing tunnels, not creation of new tunnels, but uh, asset management maintenance of uh, existing tunnels. Um, and then of course, uh, it uh, expands the funding to the bridge enterprise uh, through the application of that uh, uh, bridge, um, I'm going to get it right, the uh, bridge and tunnel enterprise fee. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, the bill includes a, a lot of different features related to accountability and transparency, and I won't go into these in detail. Um, you know, a, a lot of focus in the bill in general on the CDOT 10-year plan. Um, I, I think there, was a, there were a lot of accolades through the process on, uh, on that 10-year plan. And um, I think, uh, you know, we, we all did, uh, I, I think, uh, such a good job with that, that um, it is now a requirement um, that we continue to do that. And it, in many respects, served as the model for the new enterprises, um, because all of those new enterprises will also be required to develop uh, a 10-year plan uh, by the bill. Um, obviously, a, 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 a strong focus on, uh, on climate, clean energy, air quality, some reporting requirements associated with that, including uh, reporting on the 2030 EV plan, progress against that plan, and progress against the GHG roadmap, uh, and then a lot of features related to ac accountability and transparency, um, really building on the work, I would say, that we've already been doing over the last few years, and, uh, and, and similar to the 10-year plan, making it a requirement. Um, so uh, a focus on continuing to do the type of reporting we've done with the Senate Bill 267 dashboards, uh, making more available to the public information on what are the projects we're funding, what's their status, um, how much of that, uh, that, how much is that project costing for right away versus pre-construction versus construction. So, uh, again, um, uh, really building on what we've already been doing, but uh, but holding ourselves accountable by by requiring us to do it. Let's go ahead to the next slide, Jennifer. Um, so this is where I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit on uh, on on the dollars and cents and what it means to uh, to see that. So, out of that 5.4 billion dollar plan, um, about 3.5 billion or two thirds ultimately flows to CDOT and is directed by CDOT. Um, the balance uh, of that uh, beyond the 3.5, um, the remainder of that uh, goes l um, largely to locals. Um, and to the enter electrification enterprises uh, nested in either CEO or CDBHE. So about three and a half billion directed by CDOT, a little less than a billion um, out to cities and counties through the HUTF formula, and about 400 million to the two enterprises at CEO and CDPHE. So looking at the three and a half billion that comes to CDOT, um, uh, State Highway Fund is obviously the biggest share of that, about two and a half billion. Um, the bridge and tunnel enterprise, uh, a, a little over half a billion. Um, Non-attainment enterprise, about 184 million, uh, 135 for the clean transit enterprise, 85 for revitalizing main streets, 
and about 67 for the multimodal options fund. That's just the CDOT share. So the multimodal options uh, and multimodal and mitigation options fund is about 450 million over over a decade. 85% of that will pass. Well, all of it will actually pass through CDOT, but only about 15% of it, which is what we're showing here, are the CDOT directed dollars. The 85, which we're not showing here, are the dollars that pass through CDOT but are just going to local, ultimately going uh, to uh, to local projects. Um, this slide gives you a picture of of sort of the cadence at which we receive funds. Um, Obviously, the, uh, the, the bill is, uh, is front-loaded. There is a, a significant uh, infusion of funds at the very beginning. Um, and, uh, and, and there's, I'd say, two reasons for that. One, because we have stimulus funds today uh, that, that we're able to allocate that we won't have in, in the next few years. The other is that, as you can tell, the fee revenue builds over the, the course of the period. We, we really don't hit kind of the the, the upper limits of the fee schedules until the end of the 10-year period. And so uh, it also gives us a little bit of front-loading to help uh, uh, um, uh, get us a little bit further ahead, recognizing that it will really be a few years before we see uh, more substantial uh, amounts coming through for, you know, on the fee revenue front. Um, let's go to the next slide here. Um, well, actually, before you do here, I want to make a po point here. Um, one thing to note kind of as I transition to the next slide, um, with the exception of the state highway fund, every single one of these sources are pretty, uh, um, it's, it's pretty clear what the purpose and use is, right? It's pretty prescribed. Bridge and tunnel needs to go to our, we'll go to our bridge and tunnel enterprise and it'll go to four bridges and, and uh, improving our existing tunnels. Non-attainment, we'll go to air quality mitigation. Uh, clean transit for transit electrification. Um, I'm gonna jump, focus in on the state highway fund dollars because one, they're the biggest amount, but two, they are the dollars that are not readily apparent um, uh, they are more flexible, but they also have more commitments and needs against them. So that's what I'm going to focus in on next. Absolutely. Yeah, so would it be possible to help bracket this with what our current uh, funding is? We see this dramatic drop in fiscal year 23. Is that a drop from current funding or an absence of the additional funding? That, that is an absence from the additional. So this is incremental. I'm not showing anything that is essentially already uh, part of CDOT revenue. Um, but what you're seeing there is just, if you know, if you, the fee revenue doesn't start until fiscal year 23. So if you drop off that big bar, um, what you'd be seeing is, our, is the fee revenue in the package. Um, that big bar is just the front loading that is included in the bill um, of, of general fund and stimulus dollars. Um, so let's let's go ahead one more slide. So the um, two and a half billion is a lot of uh, a lot of money, but I, I want to emphasize that that's over 10 years, and I, I also have to emphasize that there's some commitments against those dollars, most notably our COP debt service. The largest portion of um, both that green, that fiscal year 22 bar, that big spike, and the largest portion of the total uh, is actually the dollars that go to our 267 debt service. Um, that was a key feature of the bill, was essentially addressing a long-term plan for that debt service, um, and, uh, and um, to the extent that you can, locking in um, the, uh, uh, the, the general fund commitment. Um, of course, that can't really be locked in, but uh, uh, a big feature was putting in place the plan that would allow us to essentially have confidence in moving forward to year three and four of 267. So about a billion and a half of that 2.5 billion is really the debt service that will, uh, that will uh, um, uh, be paid by CDOT uh, for the Senate Bill 267 COP. Um, the other thing to note, um, I've noted on here a backfill of HETF revenue. You're probably wondering, well, what is that? Well, one of the things we kind of have to keep in mind is that while we're collecting uh, some new EV revenue, that EV revenue is, uh, is coming as cars stop paying the gas tax. So we're able to forecast roughly over the window how much do we think of our base HGTF revenues might decline as our new revenues come in as EV revenue, and it's in the ballpark of 200 million or so. Um, so a portion really is kind of backfilling uh, the loss uh, associated with vehicle transition to EV. Um, there, there are, there's a, a, a little bit of a backfill to the temporary faster fee reduction, assuming we want to keep the faster programs whole. And then the balance, about three quarters of a billion, is really the dollars that we would say are flexible, 
dollars that could go to 10-year plan projects. Um, all of these are estimates. The, the revenue projections themselves are estimates. Um, but I would say some of the, 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 the COP debt service is not an estimate, but uh, the, uh, the, the backfill of HETF revenue is. So good, good question, um, and I would, rather than give you the, my off the top, top of my head answer, which I'm not sure is correct, I'd rather get you some of the actual variables that we're using in our model. Yes, thank um, you. But I can, I can get you that. I can get you kind of some of the underlying macroeconomic data that, that goes into the, the modeling. To the best of your knowledge, nothing outrageous that suggests we're going to somehow grow at this very, very aggressive growth rate that this whole thing would fall apart if you didn't grow at that kind of uh, rate. Correct, correct. Um, generally speaking, I would say our, our forecasting, and I'd say this is true of probably the, the state um, OSCB or Ledge Council, um, is, is probably, if anything, slightly conservative. Um, and, and we certainly hope that's the case. <laughs> um, so next slide, please. Um, all right, so I'm going to bring in a couple things here, real, and, uh, and then I'm going to try to wrap up and hand it off to Rebecca. Um, for some more uh, content on planning and environment. Um, the, what you'll see here is that the blue bar in fiscal year 22 um, is, is uh, so, well, what we're showing here is really kind of the flexible revenue in the bill. Again, the dollars that aren't preordained to go to bridge enterprise, revitalizing main streets, clean transit, multimodal. Um, I showed you the first part of that as being the state highway fund revenue that we said is probably order of magnitude about 750 million that we might we'd probably be able to put to new 10-year plan projects. Um, the other now I'm layering in a couple of other things. One is the bridge and tunnel enterprise, uh, additional half a billion in bridge and tunnel. Um, the reason we're showing that here is because a lot of the 10-year plan has a lot of bridge and tunnel in it, and so I, the, you know really the reality is probably all of those dollars ultimately could go to 10-year plan projects. Um, so you layer that in, and then the third thing I'm layering in, um, although not technically part of 260, is the remaining year three and four 267 dollars, um, and and that's in the gray bar, and we've kind of layered that in, not based on the year that that they will be received. The remaining years of 267 is really just fiscal year 22, uh, and and what we just received, but we're kind of layering that out really more in terms of when those dollars are really going to go out to projects. But that kind of illustrates that we still have. You know, we have a pretty big surge over the next few years, um, and, uh, and then that surge will, will start to taper off, but we will be, still go back to a, a significantly elevated place than we, uh, we uh, otherwise would be, um, around the tune of about 200 million, probably 150 to 200 million uh, in additional uh, revenue for projects a year uh, when we, uh, we hit the, uh, the higher end towards the, the later years. Um, so I think, can you go to the next slide? I think this is maybe where I'm going to stop um, and uh, make sure Rebecca has some time to, to cover the planning and environmental pieces. All right. Good afternoon, Commission. Um, so I know you all have, have heard and noticed that the environmental provisions in Senate Bill 260 were a pretty significant part of the bill. I'd say also just kind of seeing a bit how it transpired, they were also a really key part of building the constituent, constituency that would get behind the legislation. In fact, there were a, a couple of environmental groups who, in the end, um, supported the bill, which is um, pretty significant. Um, you know, Kay, Kay is here as well and could speak to a lot of the additional funding that does come to electrification, which I think will be just transformative for the state. But what I wanted to talk to you today are um, some provisions in Section 30. And this is really the heart of where some of the environmental requirements are. Of this 207 odd pages, section 30 is probably only about five pages. Um, so it, it may be worth a, a print <laughs> uh, and close read, but that's where I'm pulling this language from. And it's pretty significant language that I think puts us, um, when we look across the nation at other DOTs, sort of at the forefront of how we consider the environmental impacts of our decisions. Um, so it's, 
it's pretty interesting and transformative language, and it's, it's really broken into a couple pieces. Uh, the beginning of Section 30, which I, I don't have on the slides here, but there's some um, declaration language at the beginning that just acknowledges that oftentimes when we have large projects, particularly when they're next to disproportionately impacted communities, they have an impact on people's lives and their health. And so there's some, some pretty strong statements um, at the beginning of this, this section. The requirements themselves, though, divide up into some new requirements on planning and some new requirements on environmental study. And I would uh, also uh, suggest there's sort of three themes that carry forth here. One is this increase, increased attention to disproportionately impacted communities. That language comes up a lot, um, actually, all throughout the bill. Sort of a new term, I hadn't heard it much until House Bill 1261 passed, but uh, I, it's very akin to how we think of environmental justice communities, and the, the language is defined on there on, on how a, a DI, which is the shorthand now, how a DI community is defined. The second theme would be you're going to see some language around particulate matter, particularly <laughs> fine PM, PM 2.5. These are the smallest particles that are emitted largely by diesel vehicles now. Uh, there's significant public health concern. Colorado has not been in non-attainment status for fine PM. So we, by kind of traditional environmental study federal requirements, we haven't really had to pay close attention in the past. We've, we've looked at it, we've done inventories, but because our main objective in the past in NEPA was to really conform with the, the national FHWA requirements. This wasn't a topic that we typically dive deep on. That changes with this legislation. The third theme is just a focus on greenhouse gas emissions. And that comes up first in terms of these planning requirements. Um, so importantly here, the language in both these provisions I'll talk to is focused on regionally significant projects. That's, that's very important because that does limit the scope um, to those projects that I think we want to, to pay more attention to, the ones that really expand capacity, have a big impact. They're largely going to be the projects we see in the front range. Regionally significant is now a term we use when we decide whether to SIP projects. It's a term used to determine whether we're going to model a project for ozone. It doesn't have a consistent definition, though, and so this is probably an early area we're going to have to look at as CDOT, is whether we want to go ahead and have our own de definition of regionally significant. You can imagine in the legislative process, this probably would have been pretty fraught to try to define. Is it a dollar amount? Is it a location? So I think it's great that we have the ability to look at that, but we do have a long history of kind of making this determination for projects we step or do ozone. So then for regionally significant projects, um, it, it, it has some requirements for both of us, the, the agency itself as well as the commission. And this will look sort of like familiar language because it really is modeled after the work we've already been doing on the greenhouse gas rule and the discussion we had yesterday. So it really just points the agency and the commission to follow through on the work we started. There's a reference to implementing the rules issued pursuant to 257105. Um, that is actually the Air Quality Control Commission's uh, statute there and, and their definitions of their what they're supposed to focus on, as well as 251072, and that's where the Air Quality Control Commission uh, incorporated House Bill 1261 and greenhouse gases. So it, it requires us to move forward there and implement new procedures and guidelines. Um, that follow through on, on these pieces of, of, uh, of, of the law now. And, and as we talked about yesterday, I think for us this will mean adopting a new rule um, through the, the planning rule or amendment to our current rule. The third bullet here in that sub-bullet says that we are to apply the same level of analytical scrutiny to greenhouse gases as other pollutants of, confirm, of concern. Uh, that is pretty much the extent of the language, so that's up to us to define, but I would say this, this would cause us to look at greenhouse gases much the same way we look at ozone currently. The similarity there is ozone is a regional pollutant, so it's looked at as across a set of projects at a plan level and not at a project level. 
greenhouse gases as a global pollutant, it kind of makes sense to have that same level of scrutiny. And then the last bullet I get a lot of questions on is to consider the role of land use. Um, consider is a very important word there. I think there's a lot of acknowledgement about uh, the long history of local control in Colorado over land use decisions. There's also a lot of acknowledgement that those land use decisions have a big impact on the decisions we have to make at CDOT and the Commission to invest in our roads um, because communities are growing. Uh, so some pretty significant language there. And then another piece, the final bullet, it is not in Section 30, it's in another part of the bill, but it was uh, put in by the legislature to sort of move us along. So it says, that by October 1 of 2022, we are to update our 10-year plan to be in compliance with the, the policies and regulations that we adopt. If we don't, and if Dr. Cog and North Front Range don't, being the two MPOs that are in the ozone non-attainment area, that's been kind of the, the focus for a lot of the co-benefits of what's been discussed about. So if we all don't update our plans by then, we lose flexibility in our use of multimodal I'm going to bungle it. Uh, options and we, thank you. We added a new uh, M there, fund. We do not lose these dollars. It just says that we can only spend them on efforts that move us towards compliance. So sort of a carrot slash stick there that applies to CDOT, Dr. Cog, and North Front Range. So that means that pretty soon after we've all done our work in the greenhouse gas rule, I need to come back to you all with thoughts on how we update our plan. And that will very much depend on what that level is we set in that plan of how many emissions we want to see of how significant an update that is. Rebecca, can I ask a question yeah. about the land use one? I'm sure you've had all the questions I could think of already asked of you, but when it says consider the role of the role of land use, and then the next bullet says update their plans. Are you talking about planned land use, existing land use? What is it everything? Well, those are a good question, Commissioner. Those are two different provisions, actually. So we're to consider the role of land use. It's sort of generally stated, and I. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't say you have to do that in necessarily in our 10-year plan, but I think that's sort of the thought, is that as we update our 10-year plan, we're sort of to consider the role of land use in the projects we pick and what influence that's having on those projects. That's my best way of kind of interpreting it now. So perhaps good land use or acceptable land use is a criteria for investment? <laughs> <laughs> I shrug my shoulders. Yeah. Well, it'll or, be interesting to see how this goes because, you know, Dr. Cog works on their, they've just done their 2050 plan. Yep. They're not terribly excited about no, <laughs> going sure again and updating. No, I'm sure they're not because they yeah. do robust outreach and they work with all the municipalities that are part of Dr. Cog to make sure that the land use that they have prescribes a population that can be supported by the water supply that's there and the infrastructure grid that's there and all of that. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm sure that it'll come to light eventually, but just curious as to how land use will be beneficial or detrimental to a project. Commissioner, I can offer a couple different areas where we're leaning into this right now. We did hire, for the first time ever, a land use specialist in, in my group, uh, Nathan Lindquist. And he's actually, in the last two months, been out, and, and you were there with him, um, right. going to communities across the state and, and talking actually about Main Street, which is such, a, and it's such an important nexus in land use and our transportation, that in a lot of communities, the Main Street is our road, CDOT's road. We have just invested a lot of money in safer Main Streets and revitalizing Main Streets. Those programs together have got well over $100 million out there. So we're having these discussions across the state with those cities that got those dollars and saying, what is, you know, what were you thinking when you asked for these funds? What is CDOT missing? How can we be a better partner? And I think that's the focus we want to continue to have. The other example I would give is the mobility hub and the nexus with land use there too and transportation oriented development. So I think in just talking to Director Liu, she sees that as our space 
And I think it makes a lot of sense. And, and the communities we've talked to have been really receptive to those conversations. I don't know if you have more perspective on the Broomfield conversation. but Yeah, I do think that that conversation was a good one because um, the, particularly something like a mobility hub where the development on either side is amenable to transit-oriented options mm -hmm. and not totally dependent on um, suburbs that are reliant on cars only. So, I mean, I do think it is just, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see how Dr. Cog handles this um, and how the municipality. So, for example, at Dr. Cog, because it's such a front range region that's very diverse, we have a hard time coming to consensus about things like the um, employer troop reduction program, yeah. where some areas are more inclined to accept those conditions than other areas who feel that they're business repellent instead of business friendly. And it's sort of the political divide of um, that land use conversation, whether you're a city or a county or an agency, because cities and counties hold very closely the land use ability, the decision making for land use. Something we can talk about as it moves forward, but um, certainly Kathy and I have had long conversations. Yeah. Uh, PPACG, uh, good, um, good question, Commissioner. Uh, they, you're right. They are. If they go into ozone non-attainment, they will become under this requirement. Um, they, everything I've seen so far is there a ways out from that. Even, even if we have a bad air quality season, just because it takes about a year to do. But you're absolutely right. It's really applied to the ozone non-attainment area, and PPACG is sort of hovering on the cusp. So consider is a very passive word, really. It's like it could be interpreted that you see it, uh, but you don't have any power over it, which is kind of the case. So it sounds like in, in the items that you mentioned in terms of where you're leaning, it's where, where might you have agency to deal with this in a positive way. Exactly. Uh, but how do you deal with the opposite side of that, where you don't have um, any measure of control and you're just in a responding mode to land use decisions that are made in, in different regions? It's a question. <laughs> it is a question. Um, and there may not be an answer, <laughs> I understand. You know, the, the RTDs here have been on the front line of this for a long time, and I will say one tool um, that I've seen that's been successful is these planning and environmental linkages study. They're sort of that, it's pre-NEPA, and what we've been able to do with communities is sit down with them in those early stages of growth and look at what they think is going to happen over a corridor and have CDOT at the table so that we can say, oh. <laughs> Um, and so I, I, I am looking back, but I, I've, I've heard a lot from the RTDs that that's really been helpful just to even have us in those discussions and at the table so that we're able to have a voice and plan for what's coming. But I, I, I think having this language in the bill means we're, we're going to have to talk more about this um, across the state government. DOLA has a role here, CEO. CDPG, um, so there's lots of departments that I think are interested in engaging. Green light. And one more question, if I may, and it has to do with ozone non-attainment. Um, coupled with these required actions regarding ozone non-attainment, is there uh, an ancillary push to actually have ozone measurements made in more rural parts of the state? No, not in not in this bill, at least. Because there's we don't know in many parts of the state where we sit, and transportation density of population 
are one contributor, but there are other contributors to ozone, right? Yep. Uh, and so the absence of even routine measurements in many parts of the state leave us wondering whether there are other areas that should be uh, attended. Commissioner yes. Stanton. Thank you for a good brief, Rebecca. Just a consideration regarding legal representation to protect, protect CDOT and the Transportation Commission. A couple examples. If you put in more environmental sensors and you're trying to protect EJ slash DI communities, et cetera, some people will sue because you haven't reduced the rate. So think outside the box so that we're protected, not just on that one, but the idea that we're now going to be in rulemaking, we've, 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 our uh, role has expanded. I think we need to go in with the eyes wide open. Hopefully people won't sue us, but they might. Commissioner, that's actually a great transition to the next slide. Um, if I could move us there. And this is on the, the other side of the coin. So these are additional requirements for the environmental study process. Again, focused on regionally significant projects, which um, for environmental studies mean these are gonna be where we're doing environmental impact statements largely. We've only done a couple in Colorado actually, they're pretty rare, um, or environmental assessments. So these are projects that already require a little bit extra um, scrutiny and analysis just because they are the larger projects. But there's some, some key pieces here. Um, the first bullet is expanding some of the work we already do under NEPA, which is largely focused on um, ozone and particulate matter 10, the coarse dust, um, to look at the broader suite of pollutants that the EPA has, has said are important, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. But another key word here, um, Commissioner Stanton, you've nailed it, is to provide monitoring and measurement of criteria pollutants prior to construction. Um, so this, this this is significant. We are already out there doing this on I-270 and we're already doing it on Floyd Hill. And these are, I would say, are the two biggest regionally significant projects we have now. So um, while this is important, it's not setting precedent because this is the direction I think Director Liu was already moving us in. We have these monitors set up. Um, we're working on, on providing that information to the community. And we also did that on Central 70. Uh, and it was actually received really well um, by at least from my perspective and working with the community that we were so transparent about um, knowing that was a concern and providing the information. Um, I noted earlier that particulate matter is, is noted in the bill. That second bullet says we are to uh, develop and implement a particulate matter construction plan. So that will get at um, both dust and that fine PM from diesel equipment and looking at what we can do out on the construction site. Uh, we did try to do some work with this on Central 70. I think we have a lot more to learn. Um, there's a lot of issues here with making sure our DBEs don't have a, an undue burden here because the, it's very expensive to buy a new piece of equipment that meets the modern EPA standards. So uh, we'll be doing a lot of, of work to figure out how to implement this. Uh, dust is a lot easier. We wet things and, and pull uh, covers over trucks. Uh, but it also requires that we have our monitors out on site and that they issue uh, alerts to the teams so that before air quality conditions reach an, a level which is not good for public health that we're taking action out there. And for fine PM, unless you have clean equipment, you really just kind of need to shut down the engines. Um, and then another requirement to develop and implement a plan to mitigate air quality impacts on communities. That's another pretty significant piece with a focus in particular on disproportionately impacted communities. Uh, Central 70 has been what we'll probably lean to as we, we did a lot of creative mitigations there. But there's a lot of new work coming out now on the advantage that things like trees and plantings and screening walls can do for air pollution. Okay, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up. Grant, there is a grandfather clause. The legislature did acknowledge that at any given point within CDOT, we have a whole host of environmental studies that we're right in the middle of, and having something like this kind of land in the middle of that would be really difficult. So this does not apply to any projects that are completed um, anytime from now through July 1 of next year, except for I-270. 
that that was a, that's been a, a big focus. And so, um, like I said, we're already in this work for I-270, so it, it's not a big deal. But it, I did want to note it was called out in the bill. Commissioner. So, uh, as I listen to both of you, I, I guess one of the things that's coming to mind are our responsibilities for <laughs> how we account for manage the air quality while completing our projects, which is a big part of what I hear you discussing, Rebecca. And then I'm hearing this other part for what is our responsibility that once we've added two lanes or once we've, you know, we've done some other project and it's finished, our ongoing long-term responsibility for how we have to monitor, manage, and make adjustments for, for poor air quality on projects we completed in the past, what is our responsibility for those and how do, how do we how do we put systems and processes in place to track that such a good question commissioner um so for monitors not not as much the monitoring really is focused on the construction period i i will say for i-270 and for central 70 we've already made a commitment to have the monitors out there for an additional year post construction so we can kind of tell this before, during, and after story. However, this is where modeling comes in because already under, under the Clean Air Act and NEPA, when we study a project, we're required to look at the air quality impacts out over 25, 30 years. So we use models like the one Eric talked to you about to do that, and we look at, at all the VMT we expect to come from the corridor, um, project the emissions from that, and compare it against the standards. Uh, the national standards. This importantly does not set, for instance, a new state standard for, say, fine particulate matter. What it says more is that we're to take a closer look at it, we're to do that extra modeling work for things like fine particulate matter that we wouldn't have had to do under NEPA and the Clean Air Act, and to provide that information to the public. So it's definitely more analysis and disclosure, and then for us to look at those long-term mitigations so I would say things like the screening walls, the tree planting, things like that will have a long-term benefit on air quality long after the project is constructed. But if we find that somehow we're not succeeding with that in terms of the standard, we will be expected to spend money to mitigate those conditions to bring them back in line with whatever the standards are. Well, that's a good question because the there's no set definition of success, right? We'll, we'll model this during NEPA. We'll, we'll provide that information to the public. We'll develop a series of mitigations that we think will address that impact, and we'll build those. But there's no requirement that we have to come in in five years or 10 years and up that investment. It really is you do the best job you can in designing the project and funding it, and then, and then you kind of move forward from there. I have a question. There's a lot of focus on disproportionately impacted communities in, in this and a lot of other things going on around the state. Do you have a commonly used mapping tool for disproportionately impacted communities? And if so, does it zero down in finer detail than census blocks? Great question. Um, I wish I'd had the definition in front of me, but the, the bill defines a DI community on the basis of income, I think it's percent minority, and um, housing, housing security. Um, all those factors can be tracked by the census tract. So it'll be uh, pretty easy for us to determine. And, and importantly in the legislation, I believe it's an or. So if a community triggers one of those three, and I just can't remember the percentages off the top of my head, it would be considered a DI community. And do you think you need something finer than census block in terms of geographical area? I don't think so, based on the maps I've seen, that the census track allows us to get pretty darn close on information. But um, I'll be working with our GIS team. But fortunately, we have a GIS team. So um, I haven't told them this yet. <laughs> but, this is one of the, the maps I'd like to see. Absolutely, Commissioner. Um, they do. Uh, 
it will affect a lot of the rural communities, but I'll just point you back to the fact that it's regionally significant projects, which um, we just don't do many of them outside the metro area. So it wouldn't be a, a repaving, it wouldn't be um, a lot of our safety work. It's really where we're widening, building major interchanges. So along those lines, for example, what's going on uh, on Colorado 13, uh, would you consider that regionally significant? I'm looking at Mike. <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, I'm kind of getting at uh, what's the definition, right? Yeah. For for our region, that's a big project. Yeah. <laughs> so, are we boiling it down to interstates? in this definition? Uh, that's why I noted at the beginning I'd, I'd like to work with the commission. I think we're going to have to define this. And and we do have some precedent there. Um, it, you look at the Dr. Cog definition, I think they consider it a oil and north front range, a project over two miles in length, a project that adds an additional lane. I think there's lots of different tools we can look to, but we're going to have to nail this down. Yeah. But 13 is definitely more than two miles in length. <laughs> And adding capacity, right? Uh -huh. All right. And Blue Canyon is that regionally significant? <laughs> Commissioner Hickey. Yep, that's true. And and fortunately, there is the non-attainment fund, I think, which will be very helpful. Again, that's focused on the ozone non-attainment area, but to have a dedicated funding for that just so the project itself doesn't have to absorb all that cost, I think, will be helpful. <laughs> okay, so that's it. <laughs> Um, now, the, the last bullet just talks to a requirement that we go ahead and update our public engagement plan to just give it a fresh look and make sure that we're doing the best job we can um, when we uh, are working in DI communities. I will note there's also an environmental justice branch that is in this bill um, that's coming to CDOT, um, so that'll help a lot, and um, we've already been having some discussions on, on bringing some bilingual, uh, greater bilingual capacity into the department. Well, it just sounds to me like we're going to have to add a lot of administrative and ultimate uh, systems and ultimately human resources to really manage this at the same time we get this additional buck of money. We have to really be sensitive to the added administrative burden of really managing it all and delivering the accountability they're asking for and the reporting. Just, just saying the obvious because of what you're saying, I think Jeff had the slide up that basically describes some of the expectations. And I think you used the term, we've done such a good job of how we delivered on our 10-year planning process and all the other kind of uh, 
documentation and communication around it. But you know, you you're going to come back to us, and I think this is probably going to be as you learn more about what this is going to take. This is probably going to we're going to hear more about human resource needs and systems needs and other things, so that we can get the kind of reporting on this, get the kind of data that we're going to need to make sure that we are in constant compliance because staying in constant compliance gives us greater opportunity to really complete more projects with the funds that are going to be available. Could not agree more. Yep. So Rebecca, in your packet, you have 10-year plan reformat, and then here it says next step, 10-year plan project um, workshop. The 10-year plan in our packet reformat, how was that reformatted? Uh, I actually really like it. So the, the reformat is to uh, sort of break down that distinction between yes. we've got transit projects that are separate from highway and so look at them. So that's what you have on the website as well, right? It's the reformat on the website. So if someone goes to the website, they can see the check marks on this project contains this, 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 and this. Yeah. I got to double check with Marissa that we I got it so. up. I think so. I mean, I looked it up on the website, and I thought that was the same as what good. I got in my I packet. I hope so. Yeah. So when will you come back to us in July, what happens to the 10-year plan? Uh, I, in July, I don't think anything. We are going to have to, and I, we may have misworded a next step there. Um, in July, we'll probably talk about advancing the 10-year plan projects with this new money that Jeff talked about. Yeah. But it's really by that October of 2022 date, we need to figure out um, with you all what, what revisions to the 10-year plan are necessary. So we've got some time. Okay. I probably misstated it in that, sorry. No, I probably misunderstood it. And Jennifer, can you advance one more slide? And, you know, if I may make one other comment. I actually, as I sit here and think about this, this is easily to be very, something we, we all should be embracing and be very positive about yeah. because of the added economic <coughs> resources that will be made available to us. And this is really positioning us for the future and really dealing with some of these climate kind of problems that are all out there. I, I, I think this is very, very encouraging, actually, when I think about it in its totality, e even though it may require some added kind of effort administratively and otherwise to kind of demonstrate to people what we're really doing and how we're impacting it. But I do see this as all very, very positive. Well said. I I did say before it's transformative, and I really think it is. It's, there's very few DOTs with this kind of direction. Yeah, Rebecca, um, besides the 10-year plan, are there PDs and other instructions that are going to have to be revised? And do you have an order of that that eventually those are going to have to come before us too? Uh, yes, Commissioner. Um, right, right on top of my list, we have a, a NEPA manual that is our guidance document to how to implement NEPA. We have a document called the PLAG, Project Level Air Quality Guidance. Um, <laughs> there's PD 1901, which actually talks about air quality. So that's where um, that's a commission PD, and I'm going to have to look at that one and figure out if we need to adjust that. So short answer, yes. And Commissioner, the, that's the planning and environmental answer, which may have been the only uh, uh, question you were, you were, uh, all you were referring to. But I'll piggyback on that and say too that, um, you know, we'll have to update our, our a lot of our, uh, our fiscal procedures too. Our policy directive 703. We'll have to uh, amend our budget to uh, in, include new funds and new programs. Um, we're going to have to set up new enterprises. There's going to be a, you know, a, a certainly. Uh, policy and procedure associated with that. So um, plenty on that front as well. I think I'll start with the 10 year plan, the one you put out where you combined all the highway and transit into one. I feel like we still need to somehow, I'm not against them being combined the way they are, but to show which ones are, are kind of still highway and the transit with the different types of funding to differentiate that for the public, because um, 
after looking at it, I can see where some would say, well, they're getting all this money, but we're not seeing anything on the road. Um, so it kind of needs to, we need to be able to still differentiate because we have certain buckets that have to go certain ways. Um, because I, as I looked through, there were some corridors that all of it was transit, and I know there's roadway needs there, and people are going to say, you know, they may look and see, oh, there's, you know, this much money for that corridor, not understanding that there are some of those restrictions. So I think we need to still somehow show the funding source along with those corridor budget items or something so that the public is kind of aware that we have these buckets that they have to be spent on those certain areas or something. Because um, I think that could become an issue for the public. Uh, could I just piggyback? I, I totally agree with you, Commissioner Beatty, that I, I think one of the reasons I asked my question about uh, growth rates is because I, I'm very concerned about all the different buckets that are going to fund this and what happens if some of the assumptions underlying some of the buckets fall short and for people to really understand why they may not be getting what they think they should, should be getting is, is really going to be an important part of the communications and the story around this and just knock on wood that we have been, Jeff, to your point, very conservative about how this was built and the assumptions around the different revenue sources. But I think the whole story of communicating all of the pieces of where the money is going to come from what is to be spent on by CDOT and others, and then what happens if for some reason some of it doesn't show up in the, in the amounts that people assumed would be there when we put this together, it could be important down the road. So I do think that trying to at least at a very high level, because you, know, you could exhaust yourself probably getting down into the granularity of all of this, but I think at a very high level if if you could do that, it would probably be helpful to people uh, that are our constituents. Thank you. And then the other piece is the air quality measuring and how we account for pollutants or things that may be in, in the air here that's not coming from things we have control of, whether it be fires in Arizona being pushed in or a wet spring where we have lots of pollen and things, you know, mice, allergies and things. So I'm sure a lot of that falls into a particulate matter that may be detected. Is there some differentiation of naturally caused particulate matter and things? Because that's my concern is some of these things are in the environment we live in, regardless of what we do. If it's a wet year, we're going to have increase. If it's a dry year, we're going to have more dust just because everything is so dry. So. How, how do we differentiate what we are able to con con control or have an influence on compared to the environment that we naturally live in? So I guess, how do we account for that? And make sure we're not chasing something because of a one year, like last year, I know some areas were concerned about the not being able to have a exemption because of the wildfires and suddenly you're out of attainment, but really you had no no way to be in attainment because it was totally out of the area yep. ability to control. Yes. How super, do you balance? Super good <laughs> question. Um, I'll just say quickly that uh, because there is a whole monitoring network out there run by the CDPHE, that's picking up what's going on statewide. So when we see uh, wildfires like we did last summer, that shows up at every monitor pretty much across the state. So you can look at the ones we have next at the highway and they track almost exactly with monitors elsewhere and so it, it's really helpful tool for us to say yeah something's going on out there but it's going on everywhere what gets a little harder is on i-270 suncores right there so suncore burps right and um but uh the technology is pretty amazing that you can um, do some sort of speciation on the pollutants and be able to identify what's industrial it takes a little bit more work but I, I think for I-270, that's going to be a challenge for us is just to distinguish because that is such an industrial corridor. That's going to be a little bit more complicated than we're having a high ozone day, we're on fire, things that are happening kind of way outside of our control. Yep.
I hadn't made this comment before, but I think it's appropriate. I was so delighted to see the attention to disproportionately impacted communities or uh, economic and environmental justice and the air quality issues in this bill. And as you said, I think it is going to be transformative that now there's money uh, and policy um, tied to uh, what CDOT does in, in ways that are new. So. Uh, but my second question is I've not been party to the formation of the new enterprise zone. So how how is the board for the new inter enterprise zone um, decided? Who sits on that and how that is configured? So inquiring minds want to know. The, the the bill does articulate, I believe, in the case of the, all of the new enterprises, um, the the number of positions uh, on each enterprise and, um, and and some of the makeup in terms of you know how many from this area or this particular group. Um, and then uh, my understanding is those are uh, um, uh, gubernatorial appointments confirmed uh, by the Senate. You can hear me correct me if I'm wrong, but. Correct. So there would be um, there would be two new boards under the CDOT umbrella: the non-attainment enterprise uh, and the clean transit enterprise. And and actually, Herman, maybe you can help out because I honestly I'm not sure that I um, off the top of my head I'm not familiar with the explicit articulation of the positions on each of those. Do you know? So I, I think probably if that's if if that's the if that's the decision that it probably would be a standing appointment by the chair. Mm -hmm. Well that's what I would think. Instead of the executive management team designating one person off the commission. Because that's happened before when um, we had the transportation funding committee um, executive management team just chose somebody but so I, I think right but it doesn't say in statute how that person will be chosen and that's my point is I think if it says that, that it should be added to the appointments that the chair makes. All right, um, Mr. Stanton and then somebody else. No, I was just gonna second what you said. I think it's important that the TC chair be able to designate a person. And that way we are sure we have somebody in the clean transit. And it seems we should have an observer on the non-attainment also somehow maybe our ad hoc committee chair or somebody to be on this non-attainment enterprise. Lots of moving parts, but um, pretty exciting. 
What, your what's the uh, is it these these new uh, enterprises? Their their new their day of operation or coming into existence would be the beginning of the next fiscal year. Or so so good and and um, kind of on the slide that's up in front of you, we we talk about uh, some of that as being a 12 month time horizon. Um, I think that uh, I'm I'm not sure that the bill specifies you know m sort of micro level detail on what needs to be done when. That being said, I think we we want to have new enterprise structure in place probably before the point in time when those new enterprises will start be receiving start to receive revenue, and probably I would think um, somewhat well in advance of that so that they can start planning uh, their operations. And I think to that effect, the bill actually does um, provide for the ability to uh, extend a, a loan to the enterprises, recognizing that they will, if they're in existence prior to receiving any revenue, they've got no uh, operational funding. So we have not worked through exact timelines on all that, and I think maybe Kay can speak to the uh, to the clean transit enterprise. I see her raising her hand. And, and Kay, does that also assume that we will have appointed the management, and the, or do these require separate uh, management teams and structures outside of, or do you envision that these are just entities legally, but operationally, you don't have to create separate <laughs> management and operational structures for them to exist? I, I think probably, um, the, the answer is probably a little bit of both. And I'll, I'll give you um, an example. With our current enterprises, um, we have dedicated enterprise staff, for example, in the case of HPTE, but we don't duplicate you know, um, contracting functions, accounting functions, et cetera. Um, I would probably expect in the case of the new enterprises that you, you may have, <laughs> thank you. You, you, you may have uh, a small number uh, of, of dedicated maybe programmatic staff, but I would say a lot, the operational staff probably is not uh, enterprise, and, and you might have something like a, uh, a a fee for performance type of a relationship where we have to pay between the the different entities. So you could bring them up and have them operational and running pretty smoothly, pretty uh, easily, and fitting with Kay's notion about dates when the board's in place, budget preparation, all the things you would need to have uh, with the loan uh, assumption up front, so that if the funding from them from the state doesn't start immediately, everything you need to have in place operationally, you could put it in place and they would be up and running pretty pretty smoothly. Correct. I think the I mean I think as Kay indicated and I didn't catch this point, but that the appointments are by Octo October. Um, you know, I think that that is that I think we probably will want to move quickly so that we make appointments and we have some infrastructure for those appointments to start working within. But but really we you know we do have um, a year plus before they actually start receiving revenue. I don't think anybody really wants to leave, but um, I think we're probably adjourned unless uh, there's anything else. Thank you all. <laughs>